Uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, we've we've hit the eight forty mark, so I think it's time to uh, to kick off on day two. Um, so yeah, I'm John Medway. I'm uh, the director of the Global Digital Farm Initiative at CSU, and the um, chair for this morning session. Our our first talker today is Dahi Al Shamari from the Precision Ag Lab at the Uni of Sydney. Um, Dahi is a research fellow at the Uni and is working on a number of GRDC funded precision ag projects. His research interests are modelling of crop yield, crop type, soil carbon and soil constraints. And today he's going to be presenting on decision support tools for understanding yield variation. Thank you. Oh, thanks for the introduction. So my name is Dahi al -Shamari. I'm a postdoc at the University of Sydney. And currently, I'm working on uh, GRDC funded projects for yield gap mapping and yield variability in commercial pulse crops. And before I start my presentation, I would like just to highlight the what I'm going to present today. So, as I said, I'm working on this project for funded by GRDC. This uh, project is divided into few work packages, and today's presentation about one of the packages which is, uh, as you can see in the title, it's about exploring decision support tools to understand the within paddock yield variability. And I would like to thank the PCT, Precision Cropping Technologies Company, for providing us with the yield maps. Uh, they've been providing me with the yield maps like for like since I started my PhD 2018, and I'm sure they provide the university with lots of yield maps across growing regions in Australia. And thanks for them. And also I'd like to thank the contributors listed in here. Okay. So yield variability. Yesterday, I think the most of the presentation about this, like they talking about yield gap, yield variability. And the first step to close the yield gap, I think is understand the yield variability and the causes of the yield variability. So the, I think the agronomists, they would like to see the their yield uh, high and they like to see the yield like this one, the yellowish. Let's see, do this, I think this, yeah. So they are not interested in seeing these dark patches over there. So, but they need to understand also what's causing these low yielding areas. So to, uh, to improve their production with low inputs and low water as well, they need to understand what causing the, these low yielding areas. But unfortunately, most of the time we don't know the drivers uh, of this uh, variation. So what we need to do, we need to understand the within yield variability, what's causing the within paddock yield variability. And we also, we need to know what's the most limiting factor at each location. So for example, if we got here, let's say three of them, three of the limiting factors, we need to see which one is the most limiting factor so we can manage the paddock better and then get more yield and uh, maximize the profitability. There are different ways to do that, uh, but most of them they use, they try to link yield data with soil maps to get the answer. And we've got uh, some decision support system tools to answer. For example, here I'm focusing on the interpreter machine learning and boundary line analysis. So about the data as well, we need interpretive data. So it's not really, good idea to use, for example, the NDVI. So the NDVI, for example, tells you, oh, sorry. So the NDVI, for example, it tells you, it's, maybe it's that, that one, like let's say the high yielding areas is corresponding to high NDVI, but also there are some low patches over there, low NDVI correspond to low yielding areas over there, but just tell you that. It doesn't tell you actually what's the causing this the, the low yielding area. So it just tell you there is a problem, there is an issue. It doesn't tell you there is a uh, this caused by the diseases or caused by soil. So that's why it's not really interpretable. And you read, I think radiometric surveys, I, I find it's really difficult to interpret. Uh, for me, I don't know, but yeah, for me, it's really hard to interpret. 
And luckily we've got two projects now led by the University of Sydney, uh, funded by the GRDC as well. One of them is that they provide soil maps now for the soil, for the profile, for the whole profile. So they can provide us with the soil constraint at any depth in here. And also we've got soil model soil water balance model with which can provide us with the soil moisture maps this also as i said is funded by grdc so the first one as i said the, the three digital soil mapping i don't know how it works exactly but i know they can provide us with the soil constraint maps for different depth i think they supplying the the properties so they if you if you have a property in here, for example, they can predict at any depth, so which is really good. That's what we want. And we've got another one, which is the soil water now casting. As I said, it's also funded by the GRDC. This is really a great model, which can provide soil moisture at any depth as well and uh, at any time. So for example, if you want a soil moisture today at any special resolution, you can get it from this model. And it calculates uh, the soil moisture based on the rainfall, how much rainfall infiltrates to in the profile and how much water evaporates from ev evapotranspirate from the soil and the plant. And as you can see here, oh, sorry, I keep doing this. So actually it can provide at any time. And the good thing about this model nowadays, uh, before they used to use the ET, which is from MODIS, and now, now they they could do the they downscale the ET to thirty meter, I guess, which is which improved the soil moisture prediction, which is really good as well. So, yeah, the first model I want to talk today as a decision support system tool is the boundary line analysis. This was published by Shata and Mackie Bratney in two thousand four. And this follows the Liebig's law of minimum, which indicates that yield is not limited by the all the factors, but is limited by the most limiting factors. Uh, how to call it? the scarcest source, which is a limiting factor. As you can see here, the staves, this one, the yellowish staves. This, for example, the could be the most limiting factor in yield. So that's why it's. Uh, it's limited only by this factor, but not all, all of them. And yesterday, CN explained a bit of the how to fit the boundary line. And I just want to recall this. So it's, it's actually, it's, uh, as she said, so we fit the predictor, which is, let's say in this case, the potassium. And we fit the, also on the y-axis, we fit the yield and we draw a line in here for each property. And then we calculate the maximum yield, which is the potential yield. And then we just uh, like, we take the minimum yield. And then we, if, if, if he like, let's say he, the potassium is not limiting factor, but it's limited by another factor. And we can create like this nice map in here of the most limiting factors for each location. Oh, here the IML, the interpreter machine learning. So I like this because it's machine learning and uh, I like to play with machine learning a lot. So this was published also by Jones and others. And the idea of this interpreter machine learning is uh, to predict yield, not like the BLI, which calculates the potential yield. It's just based on the yield prediction. From that, we can get the contribution, marginal contribution of each predictor. And from that, we can calculate the shaft values. And these shaft values can be converted to the most limiting factor. So here, for example, you've got from zero to two, I think, if I can see it, yeah and minus two as well to the y-axis. So this, the most, the, the better contribute, contribution and this, the negative contribution. Yeah, and from that, as I said, we can create a map of the most limiting factor. So the, the negative contributions means, means the most limiting factor. So the 
the ESP, I think in this case, for example, the ESP here, the depth to constraints in this one. And here it shows in like in some patches, but I'll explain more in, the, what, in my case study. So if we wanna see the BLA versus the IML, so as I said, the IML, the BLA is univariate, so it's a use one predictor at a time, and the IML is multivariate, so it, it's just used all the pr predictors at a time. And the BLA is simple, uh, the IML is more advanced, and potential yield, yeah, BLA can calculate the potential yield, but IML does just based on the prediction. And the good thing about BLA, it works on small data sets, but the IML, which is the machine learning, requires large data sets. That's, that's uh, I think that's normal. And the most limiting factor based on the minimum yield predicted by a predictor, but the IML is based on the contribution of each predictor. Okay, so we got the case study. So we've got lots of data set, but I just started with this case study for like on one field from 2016, chick peel. And uh, we've got soil, ESP, CEC at the 30 to 60, 60 centimeter depth. And we've got this soil moisture for the 1st of April, the whole profile. And we modeled at 30 meter special resolution. And here are some of the results we got. So as you can see here, if you have a look, I don't know if you can see that, but we've got low, very low soil moisture on the edges. So actually you cannot see, or oh, maybe here, but uh, I, you cannot see the variation in here, but I promise there is a variation in here, but it's this affected by the native vegetation causing this very low soil moisture. So if we, maybe if we cut it like to 200, we can see the variation in here, but for now, like you cannot see the variation. And uh, for the boundary line analysis, as I said, we fit the line and we calculate each point from the, the difference from the line. And we got this, the impact of soil moisture on yield. And we can see the blue, the blue uh, colors corresponds to the higher impact. And the red is co corresponds to the lower impact. And if you have a look at the CEC, you can see also the higher CEC impact, uh, the lower CEC impacting more the yield. And the higher CEC has lower impact on yield, which is, I think, normal as well. Uh, these ESP, I don't know, it's like uh, I'm suspecting the the ESP gives like the right answer. So uh, as you can see, maybe like the yeah, and here the higher C C ESP corresponds to higher impact, but he also like the low CEC corresponds to high impact as well. So I, I'm not sure about the ESP. I have to investigate this these maps again. So here the shaft values, as I said, the x-axis corresponds to high, for example, here in my case, less yield. So from zero to negative is, uh, corresponds to lower yield. And from the zero to positive, it corresponds to high yield. So if you have a look at this here in his soil moisture, you can see these, these low values of soil moisture here, like the feature value. So low value, means low, low yield and high soil moisture means higher yield. And here this is uh, CEC, I think uh, agronomists understand more than me that the, I think that this is pretty, pretty average, the CEC. So it's not really impacting the yield a lot. And the ESB, you can see, we can see that low values correspond to high yield which is also good to see that, but we need to investigate again. And here again, some of the maps, you can see here again, the ESP impacting yield more, which is good to see. And here, here's the agreement between two methods, the BLA and, uh, and uh, the IML, you can see there is an agreement of 50 
between two maps, which is good to see, but there is a correlation be between C CEC and ESB. And once we merge both of them, the CEC and CESP, we can have more uh, agreement between them. 75, which is good. Yeah, so just to conclude, so the BLI and AMI give similar uh, results in terms of the limiting factor. As you can see here, the line, 75 is good. And the BLI gives potentially, but maybe it's like the potential yield will vary with different input. So we need to verify that as well. And the BLI works on the small data sets, which is good. And ideally both of them, they use the interpretive in, uh, interpretive inputs, which is good the, instead of using the uh, variables like the NDVI. And this for future work. So we need to improve the BLA just to generalize on different data set sizes. And actually it's not always appropriate to use the BLA. So also we need to investigate that as well. And we also, I'm, I'm also getting the data from the, uh, uh, from the National Paddock Survey. We get the APSIM estimates, yield potential estimates. We're gonna compare against that. And there is another work uh, uh, for the forest uh, frost project. Also, they're gonna investigate the yield potential. And luckily, as I said, we got the PCT to provide us with the data from 75 farms, which is really good. Thanks for them again. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dahi. Do we uh, have some questions? Nothing, John, again. So, so I'm one for you, Dahi. So with this sort of technique and, and processes working away, what, how, how long before producers be able to take their data and enter into this? What's going to be the pathway for producers being able to access this sort of technology? Uh, I'm not sure about that yet, so I have to investigate more to answer this question. Yeah, so, okay, okay. Yeah, so yep. maybe uh, maybe in the future I can answer. Okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> okay, well, thank, thank you. you, Dahi. So next along this morning, we've got uh, Alistair Holmes from Lincoln Agritech in NZ. Uh, so Alistair's a precision ag agronomist who's built a background in practical agronomic research and extension through previous, previous work as a research and extension team leader at the Foundation for Arable Research. And today, Alistair's going to be talking about profit and loss maps for precision ag in New Zealand. Thank you, and, and thanks to SPAR for organising this and, and having the opportunity to, to, to speak. Um, yeah, as, as, as was introduced, um, a lot of speakers in the last uh, day have, have looked at yield maps and variability maps, and one of my passions is turning those into profit and loss maps so growers can really focus in on, on where the profitable parts and, and uh, less profitable parts of their, their crops are. And we all know agriculture is variable and and agriculture in, in New Zealand is probably a lot more variable than Australia because of the small landscape scales that we have. And, and this is a photo taken by Trevor James, who I imagine some of you weed scientists know well, of the Foundation for Arable Research Northern Crop Research Site in a maze uh, as the maze is beginning to dry down. So you can see the huge variability present in that paddock. Now, the, a key thing about Precision Ag is some of the tools we have where we can actually start measuring that variability using harvest yield monitors. And that then gives us the ability to look at this variation in the field and then actually collect some data. So there on, on the, uh, in the photo, we've got a photo of the visual variability in that maize crop as it dries down. And then the yield map shows a very similar pattern in the yield coming off that crop at harvest. So the question then is, how can we use this yield data from multiple year, years to help growers start to make some decisions to improve their profitability? So the project was to work with growers uh, using this data 
analyze the spatial and, and temporal variation from the data and then create geospatial profit and loss maps. Explore the practical management decisions that can be made from this data and then assess the impacts on profitability. And I think at this stage, it's important to say, to talk about the differences in scale between New Zealand and Australia. I mean, yesterday we heard of a of a 800 hectare paddock. I think the average cropping farm in New Zealand is 400 hectares. And I think probably the average maize paddock would be somewhere in the eight to 10 hectare range. So we're talking vastly different scales. And because of that, a lot of the growers don't have the economies of scale to integrate some of these technologies themselves. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk through three sample paddocks that we undertook this work on. And I just put up a map yesterday. And the sample paddock we're talking about is, is the, the, in the near the Red Star there, just north of Timaru in South Canterbury. And I just put this star in last night. That green star is where I live. And just for contrast, as of this morning, we've had 2,080 millimetres of rain this year. So... <laughs> I can't quite comprehend how you farm on 100 and something millimetres a year. We're often deal and growers will be dealing with this right now, is how to dry the soil out so they can start to create seed beds. So the, the challenges are, are, are very different. Um, but anyway, for the, getting on to the, to the sample paddock. Sample paddock one is South Canterbury. It's on a mixed arable farm. Um, it, it, we're looking at potatoes in this situation. The annual rainfall of this area would probably be around 800 millimetres, which is fairly typical for, for Canterbury. Um, and we fitted a yield monitor to a grimy potato harvester and started collecting bulk crop yield mass. So we get a a yield map for the crop. And you can see there's not necessarily a huge variation there. It's actually quite a low yielding potato crop because of the market it was going to. But from this yield data, what we can then start doing is calculating a gross margin for each yield point in the paddock. And this is a step that I think a lot of growers certainly in New Zealand, don't do. They'll look at the yield map, but they won't carry it through to gross margin profitability. Um, and, and another thing that struck me yesterday was the differences in costs. One of the growers mentioned how his spraying costs were $8 a hectare. I, I think current contract rate's probably $50 a hectare in New Zealand for spraying, something like that. So it's huge quantum and differences. So at each point in the paddock, we can work out a geospatial gross margin. And that then gives us a picture like this, where we can start to see the green area where you're getting a pretty good profit, and then the red area where you're, where you're actually losing money. Now, this is for just one crop. And the reason why we, we included this was it shows a very, a very simple story. If you overlay the center pivot irrigator, on this map, you see a very clear relationship between the profitability and the centre pivot irrigator. And when I talked to the grower about this, they said, oh, yeah, we were meant to move laterals by hand, but it was Christmas Eve when we were due for the next round and they never got done. And, and that's, a very, that's a very human story. And so what we then started to do was, well, how can we look at the profitability within that centre pivot irrigator versus outside that centre pivot irrigator? And you can see the difference there, a huge difference in the, in the gross margin within and without the and outside the centre pivot irrigator. And, and this is all very well, but it's very important to sit down with the grower and say, well, well so what? What does this mean for your operation? And in this case, we can say, well, there's management-induced variability from the infective irrigation. That's fairly obvious. So in future, they will grow the 13 hectares in this paddock under the centre pivot irrigator in the high-value crops, and they will grow, grow the remaining 4.5 hectares outside the centre pivot irrigator in lower-value crops with less reliance on water, such as barley, um, which will, which will uh, reduce the need for irrigation, but it will also take a lot of pressure off them as to trying to move those uh, irrigation lines by hand. Okay, sample paddock two 
is a long-term maize grain paddock in North Waikato. So any of you've been to New Zealand, it's it's and flown into Auckland International Airport. It's probably only about twenty kilometres south of Auckland International Airport in the Waikato. There, this is a paddock that's grown maize grain for a long time. Um, and the seven-year average yield for this uh, paddock looks as such, and you can see there's a, a, a quite a large variation with a low performing part of the paddock at, at this end. And when we break that down into profit and loss over seven years, you can see that this area is generating a loss over seven years. And when we talked to the grower about this, he said, oh yeah, I know that's a, a heavy clay piece of uh, soil adjacent to a stream. I always struggle to get a seed bed in it because it's cold and compact after winter. Um, and and they'd, he'd always had problems with it. So simply in this case, it could be a matter of just taking the end off the paddock and, and using this part of the paddock as a headland or to grow hay, which he also grows on the rest of the farm. And what the effect this has on, on profitability, and again, I feel kind of embarrassed putting up these huge paddock sizes of 7.6 hectares, <laughs> But just uh, should I put hectares thousands? But <laughs> but this is this is the reality. And I was th I was thinking about. It. I mean, some of you might know a contractor called John Austin in the Waikato. I think he does about four and a half thousand hectares of maize contracting. His average paddock size is four hectares. Now that's a lot of gates you got to drive through, and gates in New Zealand are not like gates in Australia. So it's a very different set of challenges there. And this is fairly typical. So with this scenario, if we look at the whole paddock, 7.6 hectares, the average yield is 11.4 tonnes per hectare and the gross margin. And if we change, if we reduce, I should look at this screen, sorry. <laughs> if we um, exclude a one and a half hectare area, you can see that area that we exclude is generating a loss. And also very importantly, is generally these areas that are low performing are receiving exactly the same amount of inputs as the rest of the paddock. Now, any of you who have been to New Zealand have, and, and attended our conferences or talked to farmers will probably heard of this dreaded tool called Overseer. And Overseer is a model that estimates nutrient uh, flows from farms. Um, I'd be very, I'm very careful to say it models because you quite often hear people say that overseer measured nitrogen. It didn't measure anything, it modeled it. And so if we exclude this low performing area, you can see the average amount of nitrogen loss from the paddock decreases uh, by a fair amount because that low yielding area isn't taking up as much nitrogen as the rest of the paddock. So that's very, very important. And so what? It, in, in this grower's case, there's an inherent variability because of the different soil types in that huge paddock. Um, what can the grower do about that? They could, they could deep rip it and try and open up the compaction that way. They could apply gypsum. And the but the actual solution they've they've undertaken is to actually not grow maize in that area, but to grow grass, which is then included in their neighbouring hay crop. Provides them with a headland. It provides them with nice square uh, runs. And so some very simple steps that make their make their operation easier to manage and also increase profitability. Now, the the third sample paddock. Is, is near to my, uh, where I was born in, in the Manawatu. Um, rainfall in this area is probably fairly fairly typical, around sort of 1,200 to 1,400 millimetres a year. Um, the soils in this property are a mix of, of very light sands because it's right on the coast and, and heavier uh, loams. In this case, we're looking at a, a paddock which has had um, different crops grown on it. And by normalizing the yield data from different crops, you can then compare, it will use the data from different crops to start to underline, uh, understand trends there. And you can see here, we've got uh, 
the normalized yield for wheat and the normalized yield for maize. In each case, it's from three years data. And surprise, surprise, the trends look very similar. You've got a clear edge headland effect there going on. And you can see, um, see that the, the patterns are, are, are very similar. And we can then, by working out the, the, the profit and loss for the maize and the profit and loss for the for the wheat, we can work out the six-year mean profit and loss. And you can see there's, there's clearly a large area of, of loss-generating part of this, this paddock here. And, and, a, and again, when we talked to the grower, they said, oh, yeah, that doesn't surprise us because that area of the paddock's very compacted. And so if they exclude that part of the paddock, they can increase their returns. Um, and I should have actually put up the raw yields here because this isn't this isn't a high performing wheat crop, and yet the your yields were around 14 tons per hectare. So we may not have the scale, but we've got the yield. <laughs> um, so in this case, by removing that that consistently poor performing area, they uh, remove that loss generating part of the paddock and increase their average gross margin. But again, so what? Now, in that case, they've got a management-induced compaction from consistently driving over that part of the paddock with, with heavy machinery when it's wet. They can undertake dip, deep ripping, apply gypsum, possibly put in a tile drain um, or, or grow a different crop in, the, in that situation. So summary, using profit and loss data and, sorry, I'm missing a D there, and maps can improve profitability for growers reduce workload and I think that's an important thing and as I said at the start in New Zealand we have a lot of growers that are very interested in precision ag and have taken up auto steer and section control but have struggled to really extract the full value out of some of the yield data and other data uh, like that so anything that can reduce their workload and this is an increasingly important well in New Zealand but also globally is decrease the risk of nutrient loss I didn't include one paddock, which was a paddock of potatoes, where they were putting on 350 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year. And one part of the paddock actually produced less than 10 tons of, uh, of potatoes. So that, and it was immediately beside a drain. So technically, I think it was 260 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year was going straight into that drain. So this data can be very powerful for understanding the environmental impacts. And this is uh, uh, obviously more and more critical. And the recommendations, and I mean, I'm probably teaching you to, to suck eggs on this one, is to abstain, obtain geospatial yield for your crops. And, and yield monitors now are on all sorts of harvesters. I mean, we, we heard of a grape harvester yesterday. Um, they actually, I, as I said, I live in the Bay of Plenty. We're working on yield monitors for hand harvested kiwi fruit. So there's all sorts of ways of assessing yield data. Calculate the geospatial gross margins. And I think that's a really important step to go from just straight yield to gross margin because very important to understand that profitability. Combine and compare that data over a number of years to see the long-term trends. Identify areas that consistently return low or negative profits, and then decide what to do with these areas. And a light bulb moment for me was probably about 10 years ago when I was in the UK, and any of you who've been to Europe know that the farmers over there receive a subsidy for set-aside areas. And of course, if you're getting paid money to not farm, you quickly figure out which is the poorest part of your farm, and then you get the best return by setting the side of that part. So that's, a, I guess it was an unintended consequence of that, but it made growers identify their consistently poorest performing part of the paddock and then set aside that to receive the subsidy. So in the poor performing areas, you could just reduce inputs. Um, you could identify why they're poor performing and fix that underlying issue, whether it be drainage or uh, a shelter belt in some cases is a, is a big issue in small paddocks. You could grow a different crop. As I said, the, the, the grower with the potatoes decided they wouldn't grow potatoes outside the centre pivot irrigator because it was low yielding and, and took too much of their management input. 
or you could actually not grow any crop in that part of the in part of the paddock at all. But I think again, a big difference between New Zealand and Australia is you have a strong network here of or you call them agros, agronomists who are good at working with growers in this data to help with this sort of thing. We don't necessarily have such a big network of agronomists who are skilled in this precision ag technology and, and tools to help identify. There are pockets of them, but nationally it's not as strong. And so um, that wraps up my talk. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, obviously, all the growers who are involved with this work. And, and as, um, as Brad talked about yesterday, sometimes finding this data is a challenge. Um, it'll be on a USB stick or an old laptop or still in the combine, the gathering that. Um, Matthew Gray, who um, is an ag leader, dealer, local to me. Uh, the work was undertaken when I was at the Foundation for Arable Research. So thanks to the Foundation for Arable Research. And it was funded by the Ministry of Primary Industries uh, in New Zealand. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Alison, do we uh, have some questions? Thanks for the talk. Talking about gross margin, obviously quite quality like growth on this incredible point of view. There's a lot of interest to the big Australian growers in yep. one of the interest to the sort of private plants that are out there. Um but is, is, is anyone doing protein on to the new level that have you considered including that in your work? Yes, I think Chris, there's some protein monitoring going on, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the short answer is yes, I haven't included it. And I think crop quality is an absolutely essential one. Um, because I think often in news, well, often globally, crop quality, there's your quality benchmark. And if you reach that quality benchmark, you get price. But if you drop below it, you start getting heavy um, deductions. Now, where there's a crop that you're actually getting quality, um, quality, uh, benefits for then this sort of tool becomes really valuable but certainly i think that's a, a, absolutely an important issue but it isn't included in in this in this data next question i got I'll, I'll one for you so so with the it's fairly straightforward process of, of clipping out the, the low yielding areas is there any work going on with looking at varying the amount of nitrogen going on to some of those spots because it sounds like some pretty high nitrogen use. Yes, yes. Yeah, there, there, there definitely is. And I think that's a it's a diff it's an area of passion of mine is is reducing, is matching the inputs to the crop potential. And we, you know, the growers yesterday talked about it there is there's no point putting fertilizer on for a 20 ton crop if you're only ever going to produce 14. And so there is work particularly that I'm aware of around maize with, is reducing the seeding rate because you don't need the same population to um, produce the yield and also change, uh, reducing the amount of nitrogen. And so there definitely is work in, the, in that area. And and sort of following off of that, is the most of the producers using all their own equipment or is it what proportion is the contract? It, it, it depends. I think, you know, in Canterbury, a, a lot of it's farmer-owned equipment and some contractors. In the in the northern North Island, most growers will be using contract equipment. And so I think the key, the key difference with the northern North Island is most maize is grown uh, for silage for the dairy market. And most growers of maize see it as a feed and they don't necessarily have the high level of management that a, a full-time crop grower will have. So they rely a lot on the contractor for that. So um, it's important that the contractors uh, are on board with this sort of technology because they can help roll it out to the growers. Yeah, and certainly that's one of those options where sometimes contractors might be able to justify some of the tech. Yep, yep. The, ch the challenge there is that, you know, I mentioned John Austin. Is John Austin first collected yield data, I think, in 1993. You know, he was very early on because he has friends in John Deere in Germany and they'd come down for the off-season. Um, but he's he's always struggled to see where the value is in, in selling that concept to his growers. 
He was very passionate about it early on, provided yield maps every year, but he struggled to see how that was actually adding value to his business because growers weren't necessarily using that information. And that's where I think there's a, a, there's a gap in the New Zealand market um, for agronomists to work with growers to help interpret data that they've already got to make some um, management decisions. Yeah. And I'll probably like to add a comment that's... Um, that I still think that in Australia, even that there, there's still a, a huge number of agronomists who really do struggle with trying yep. to understand this information, and it is a, a big limitation that we have. That yeah, they, we get gatherings like this where where largely people are on board and understand things. There's there's an awful lot of people out there. Yeah, right? yeah, so, absolutely. Yep. Any more questions? Here we go. Right. Sorry, the variability. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the normalizing it's the, the, sort of the, the, the easiest way is to normalize it all so the average yield becomes 100 and then you can um, uh, normalize it either side of that and that was the easiest way. Um, I think a big a big challenge and we you know talk about it yesterday and talk about it again this afternoon is data interoperability and for the combine for the for the sample paddock three there um one year was a brand new new holland harvester and ultimately i ended up having to talk to someone in germany to get that data back out of the cloud because it had automatically uploaded to the cloud the operator didn't know how to get it back out and then uh when it came through all this the headings were in german so um, it's it's a challenge, and that's why I mentioned Matthew Gray here because Matthew Gray is an absolute genius at figuring out how to extract data and get different coloured machinery talking to each other. Um, but yeah, I mean, and this is something where the, the conversation around being uh, being uh, instant is the connectivity of data. And push button is I'm not sure that we're anywhere near that at the moment because sometimes you'll come across a crop that'll say it's producing 30,000 tons per hectare and then you realize well some somewhere in there the units got wrong so you need to have I think a, a human check to make sure that the quality is of an a, a acceptable standard otherwise the, 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 the danger is you rubbish in rubbish out <laughs> Okay, thanks, okay. Russell. We'll uh, leave it there. Uh, next presenter this morning is uh, Karen Moore. Uh, and Karen's a research scientist at DPIRD and has been involved in a wide variety of research projects in the pork industry, so a slightly different uh, direction for this one. Um, primary interest is uh, pork production and welfare in grower and finishing uh, finisher periods and talking about pro prospective digital solutions for monitoring pig welfare. Thanks, Karen. Uh, thank you. So this project um, that to give you an overview today is funded by the Food Agility CRC and it um, is a collaboration of a number of uh, different organisations from university, the state government, a research um, organisation, PIWA, and then a number of commercial uh, companies from a number of industry sectors. So why did this project come about? Well, in the pork industry, there's significant productivity and economic losses due to mortality and comp compromised health outcomes of pigs during various stages of their growth. So there's a number of different avenues that people have looked at to try and improve this over time. But one of the um, one things that they thought would be valuable is through the early identification of issues. But in the pork industry, that's not always possible. The pigs are housed in large groups of up to 1,000. So it's not always possible to identify these individual pigs that are having compromised health growth. There's a demand across all the livestock industries for better animal welfare management by customers and consumers. And we also, as well as the pig welfare side, we also have the traceability side where we were being able to accurately chase our product to the end user it was desirable. So it's helping us with an evidence-based positive welfare provenance story. So there's sort of a solutions we looked at through this product through coming from the solution for the pig side and for the technological side. So a solution we were looking at for the pigs 
was to try and get real-time tracking of the pig's behavioural and physiological characteristics. And we're trying to use do this through something called an XIOT health tag. So I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But that is a tag that measures the pig's temperature and also their movement and activity around the pen. We're then going to use the data that gen is generated by the tag and use machine learning from that supported by our own physical and human observations of pig behaviour to validate it. And then hopefully we'll come up with early, be able to have early interventions for our better health outcomes. So we're at Precision Ag, so for them, the technological side, we have our health tags that are used to track our temperature, movement and location in real time on the farm. We're going to model our data against our measured and observed health outcomes because we can have a whole lot of data coming out, but what's a healthy pig and what's a compromised pig? So we need to be able to identify that. To use predictive models to enable the tracking of the pig health in real time. So again, to allow us to have these early interventions for our better health outcomes. And from the other side for the traceability to enable the processes to trace the product to the consumer. And then another component from the technological side is to identify these value creation attributes of traceability technology across people, processes, and the existing technology that's out there. So how's our project going to achieve this? Well, we have four main work streams. Um, the first one, which is what I'm mainly involved in, I'm an animal scientist, as I said, so I'm mainly involved in the on-farm data side. The work stream two is looking at taking, taking all the data that we have been collecting and looking at the data storage and processing for analytics. Workstream three is looking at the machine learning analysis and reporting. And workstream four is looking at the downstream supply chain traceability and consumer per perceptions. So just have a bit of more of an in-depth look at each of these work streams. So obviously workstream one, we're looking at trying to identify the relationships between the data, which is measured by a health tag, but comparing these to our standard measures of our pig health um, data on farm, our welfare and our environmental conditions, so our temperature and humidity in the shed. So there's two main production areas that we're doing this in. So that's looking at wean to finish. So in this particular production system, the pigs are weaned at four weeks of age and they go through to finishing, which is often slaughtered around 20 weeks of age. That's one area that we're looking at. And then the second area that we're looking at to try and improve our product Activity in our early intervention is in our sow system because that's where it's been identified. There's um, loss. So that's from when the sows enter into being mated, into their gestation, and then through to when they're weaned. So when the pigs are around four weeks of age. So it's looking at taking this tag that hasn't been used in the livestock system before to undertake some broad scale testing of the tag. And then to be able to use this data from the tag to develop a, um, a user and a dashboard, so like a tablet that can actually be used by the producer on the farm to implement some of these interventions that's going to be identified by the tag. But to do that, we need to look at what are the accuracy of our predictions of our health and welfare status and whether is it actually beneficial? We can have these variations, but is that that can be detected and these alerts? but is that going to be effective and practical to assist in our day-to-day -day pig production? So I've talked a lot about an XOIT health tag. What is it? So on uh, this side, this is a what we visualise the tag will look like in its commercial form. So it'll be a wafer that sits underneath the button tag on the inside of the pig's ear. On the real pig at the moment, our tag doesn't look like that. This is... Um, the prototype used in the first batch, it's, uh, sorry, that's the pointer, oh, just turned it off. Um, over here, we have this, the black tag here. So we've learned a lot along the way. The company involved didn't actually appreciate what we said were pigs and what they might do to the tag. So they've learned a lot about the environment, the pigs to the tag, um, that water ingress into the battery system and all that. So we've able to overcome that in our first batch in our pilot studies. So we have these tags that are um, lasting um, for about 10 weeks through our production cycle. And then there's further iterations as we go through our project. 
And so how does that work sort of in the shed layout and receiving the data? So I mentioned um, the pigs. This is in the weaning to the finish cycle. The pigs are in one um, shed on this production system from four weeks of age, 10 weeks of age, and they're in um, pens of 40 pigs. At 10 weeks of age, then they move into a big shed. So imagine this is your shed. So it has a thousand pigs all in the shed. There's one shed is one pen. And then we have our feed and water um, things up the side. This is what they look like here. So we have all these pigs, all of our pigs have been tagged with our XIOT health tag, and it's sending data off to our pink gateways here, which is collecting all of our, receiving all of our information. So that's giving us information on where the pig is in the pen. It was receiving information on their temperature data. And you see these little arrows, um, the way the gateways are facing, so it helps in the identification of where the pig is in the pen. We have some cameras in here. We're monitoring um, the pigs and the, to be able to match up some of the data that we're receiving from these gateways and just make sure is that where the pig is in the pen as we're developing this technology. And then this information goes off to be collected and that's where Workstream 2 comes into it. But before we go to that, this is looking at some of the potential on-farm applications. So we've done one batch of pigs through the shed. On the vertical axis here, we have the temperature that the tag is reading. So each of these different dots is a, is a pig and the temperature of the tag. And then we have um, time. What happened here is we had a water pipe burst in the shed in the middle of the night. And you can see that there's quite a sustained drop in the temperature of the tags coming off the pen. So one of the, as well as looking at our um, improvements in our early intervention of pig welfare, it can also have an alert system built in place if something had happened in, sort of in the shed to be able to alert the producer. So that was just um, something that happened in our first batch. So it just gave us a good idea of what this could be used for. So Workstream 2, they're looking at um, data storage, obviously we've got all this data. So they're looking at building an onboarding process for our pig health and welfare data that we collected throughout our work supply chain from our Workstream 1 data. They're going to determine the correlations between what's been measured by the tag data and any physical observations that we've collected on farms. So we have some focus pigs, we're looking at the temperature of the pigs, but also the everyday management decisions that are recorded. So um, through the pig health and the medication and hospital records that are being observed on farm. And then they need to be able to build a storage for this data. I think that the tag is sending off temperature and location measurements every one or five seconds. So there's an awful lot of data that's coming through. So they needed to be able to build a solution that can take all this data and to be able to use it to interpret it on farm. And then to be able to take that solution and then to be able to scale it up or down because there's different producers have different sizes of um, sheds. So we're doing this on one shed, but on this particular farm, they have 10 sheds at all different stages of production and that's just on one farm. So we need to be able to scale the solution. So the next stage, and we would heard about machine learning obviously before, but it's develop an onboarding process for our health and welfare data for our machine learning to able to establish the foundation for our data-driven predictions using machine learning models and develop effective reporting that adds value to the supply chain. And then to be able to apply these, once they're developed, these machine learning algorithms to predict the welfare and health of our pigs and to come out with detections and alerts and variations that come to the producer that will detect any change in the welfare status of the pigs. And then to establish a framework for ongoing training and refining of models and deploying these into production environments. And we have all this data. So one of the other concepts is to come out with something like a tablet or a user interface or a mobile platform that can be used on farm and give real time alerts to the producer that they can go and act. And whether that's at the farm level, at the vet level, it's all to be determined depending on the alerts. So we're about to commence the machine learning phase of this project. And this is just an example of 
how we think sort of the algorithm learning um, might develop. So with our algorithm continuously learning from our new data over time, so we've got a situation, we'll just give an example here where the pig is healthy, is it healthy, uh, yes or no, if it's yes, well then actually is our machine telling us the pig is sick, yes, well actually then we've got a false positive we're coming through, we're overriding the system, we're coming through and our machine is learning, our algorithm is learning from the feedback that we're giving into the system. And then our final work stream here is looking at downstream supply chain traceability. So the idea is to identify the value propositions of the traceability and welfare attributes across the supply chain, because there might be areas in the supply chain where it's more effective to deploy these ear tags. So maybe it's more effective. We're looking at lean to finish, but is it more effective and more um, cost effective for the producer to actually just employ that in their sow population? So we're looking at to assess the key res risks and enablers of the technology across people, process and existing technology. I've talked about it briefly before, but convert trigger points and identify them to enable us to derive value. And then are there changes in our existing practices that we need to do to enable us to get value out of this technology and to adopt it? So overall, our project aims to give more timely information about individual pig health to inform producers' management decisions, so to reduce mortality, improve production, so overall boosting the economic productivity. So by our early um, interventions and early identifications of the pigs that are sick, we're going to reduce the cost of treatment and hospitalization of our individual pigs. And then through the port provenance side of it and looking at greater transparency through the supply chain, there's more and more questions back from the consumers, where did this pig come from, what's happened to it? And so that will enable us to meet our consumer market requirements for our animal health, welfare and provenance. We actually call this the three Ps projects, which is pig welfare and port provenance. <laughs> so that takes it through. And I'd just like to acknowledge all my co-investigators and collaborators, who most of them were overseas today, and so I got the thing to be presenting here. <laughs> so thank you. Okay, thanks, Karen. We have, have some questions. Um, yeah, what's the, well, no, it's early days, but you're still developing the tag. What's the price for the <laughs> Yeah, so that's a good question. So there is work going on looking at that. And it's I can't tell you that offhand because that's going to be in terms of all the infrastructure associated. Obviously, there's a huge amount of infrastructure that goes associated with the tags as well. So, And then looking at we have a biosecurity aspect, so it's not like we can retrieve them from the abattoir and then take them and put back on farm, so they'll be single use. So it's looking at the cost of the tag and then the returns, and that's why we're thinking – possibly on the preliminary analysis so far that it's probably more likely to be put into sort of one area of production system rather than broadcast across your whole production system. But that's where it's been really valuable, having a whole heap of different um, people looking at it. From a, um, I'm more involved normally as the research scientist side, but people looking at the economics and that sort of side of it as well. Yeah, that's the temperature. temperature. Yeah. That's fascinating. So the range went from 14 to 14. Okay. Exactly I should say those 14s are, yes, tags that are just sitting in the shed, not on a pig, and they couldn't get them out. And the 40 is quite hard to, yeah. There is a bit of noise still in that data that we're still looking at, and that's why it's quite valuable. We're taking um, temperatures, you know, with the baby thermometers, so we're taking them of the pig's ears, just to try and get some collaboration, um, yeah, seeing what's in there to get them out, yeah. Others have. That wasn't the goal of this project, but it's actually quite fascinating from what I can see in the literature and what they come through. But the cameras are more in there to validate um, what the machine is telling us. So actually that's in the big shed, but when they're in the wiener shed, we actually wrote numbers on the side of the pigs that correlated to the pig's ear tags 
to be able to sort of give us um, confidence that what we're seeing where the, um, the pigs are. But you'll see they spend a lot of time piled up in the corner, then they come across and they'll play with the drinkers. It's really interesting what you can get out of it. Yeah. What, what about the, 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 the supply chain hub? It's really fascinating. Yes. It's really interesting. So especially with, with animals. So what how how would you have like if you had an animal that's been mistreated, how's it going to end up in the supply chain anyway? Like so oh, not mistreated, well, sorry. Well, mismanaged. Managed. Yeah. No, this is more about the provenance into the supply chain. So, and more the treated or go back. So it's provenance, tracing it all the way through, looking in the supply chain. So no, there's enough identification. Because <laughs> you can log that, obviously, to the EID of the shed. So that is something they're all looking at to try and that's just a big com another component of the project. And can you carry it all the way through? Is it actually feasible? So you use it for those so it's probably in individual yeah. pigs rather than right. pigs as a whole. Yeah. yeah, it's a huge project, and maybe in three years' time we can come back and. See and so, is, is that the time scale? So, yeah, so I think three years. We're a year in, and we've got another two years to go. So we're just sort of at the cusp of yeah, getting some real data out of it at the moment. And, and what's the scale of the, the pork industry in WA? In WA? So we have around 30,000 sows, but we're about 10% of Australia's population. But this could be extrapolated across Australia. This We're involved with one um, supply chain, so one pig production company that integrated across one thing. They have about, I'm going to say this wrong, 40% of WA's pigs. <laughs> okay. okay. Any more questions? Okay, thank you for coming. Thank you. Right. Okay, next for them this morning, we've got um, talking going, going back on farm, and we've got James Benning from Barunga Grains. Uh, James is a grower from the York Peninsula in South Australia using a, a wide range of tools for micromanaging areas in his cropping program focusing on productivity, efficiency, and cost effectiveness. In 2022, um, James was a finalist in the ABC Condinan Young Farmer of the Year and won an award for excellence in technology. And today he's going to be talking about using PA to improve input use and farm management in South Australia. Thanks, James. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, so I'll just work out how to drive this thing. but. Um... Yeah, so um, like I said, we're um, on the York Peninsula, so little red dot there, buttes on the top of the York Peninsula, sort of he heading a little bit north of where the God's country is, but um, we've got 4,700 hectares there of cropping program. Um, main crops are lentils, canola and wheat, and, and we grow a little bit of barley, but um, the historical rotation will just be a wheat barley pulse, but we're sort of changing our way a little bit with that, so we're sort of viewing cereals as our break crops now. So we're doing everything in our power to grow more lentils and better lentils and lentils are the core focus of the, of the business. And then, you know, you just grow a cereal just to get a break, which is sort of a change in thought process. Cause yeah, the old, all the old time, all the old fellas would always say, Oh, if you, if you can grow wheat, you grow wheat. Whereas now we're sort of, if we can grow lentils, we grow lentils. Um, so this is just to do a bit of background on, so you understand our soils and all that kind of, that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, annual rainfall is 400 mils. 70% um, of that's in the growing season, um, and it's a June swale sort of landscape. So hills and flats, and the, so the soils are very different but on a hill versus a flat. So um, your sands and sands to loams, and I sort of use the term loams pretty uh, – it's probably technically not really loams. Um, yeah, if you we, we call them loams because they're different to our sands, but – in actual fact, they're pretty gritty and they're probably a loamy sand, not a sandy loam. Um, yeah, so generally I'd say that we're unconstrained at depth. And when I say unconstrained, it's there's still constraints, but nothing we can't fix. So um, yeah, quite highly productive. Um, but yeah, we do have a bit of pH problems in stratified areas. Um, can have some areas that four and a half, but then we also have some zones in the paddock that are eight, eight and a half of pH. So 
PBIs are, are low and um, generally, but we do have some high stuff and organic carbon's quite low as well. Um, we probably don't get anything more than 1.2. Topsoils usually on our good country would be 0.6, but as soon as you get below 10 centimetres, it um, yeah, drops away 0.4 and quite low. Um, yeah, so this is sort of a bit of a soil test. Um, so down the left-hand side, we got, yeah, so the top of the hill. This is a soil test from the top of the hill, middle of the hill, and then the flat. So that's the sort of three different areas. And then we can see um, we segment it into four different areas. Um, but I guess the, it's a lot of noise here and there's a lot of information and um, a lot of it, I don't even understand it. But um, yeah, probably don't need to preach to WA people about pH at different levels because um, yeah, I think you guys are probably the ones that got us onto it. But um, yeah, you can see sort of in five, 10 to centimeter areas and a 10 to 20 centimeters, we're sort of getting a few issues on our top, on our hills, whereas the flats is just alkaline. So um, it was sort of a sleeping giant for us. So we would take a zero to 10 or even a yeah zero to 50 soil test and you average, you mix it up in a bucket and it's five and a half or we don't have a problem, but lentil roots do not like going through this sort of stuff. So again, like all our things we're doing is trying to push the lentil um the lentil bandwagon um yeah so and then other things uh land prices um obviously everywhere like that's on the side there that's uh that's just a national um land prices well yeah this is a local level so in 2006 we bought a farm for 600 dollars an acre 2015 three and a half 2027 and now probably around nine thousand dollars an acre and this is probably for a standard sort of um profitability like four and a half ton of wheat four ton of barley one and a half ton of lentils probably pretty variable um if you yeah when, when i say that's 1.5 of a pre pre ameliorated country that's probably averaging two ton on a loam yeah on a on the sw uh, swale uh, sorry the june yeah the swale and then the dunes are probably sub tons of the hectare if they haven't been treated but quite good canola growing country so we'll average two and a half ton of canola but we also have got a rising cost of production. So the sort of the motto of this is is why would you buy more land at, at those high prices when the profitability doesn't really work when you can um do do better what you've got. Um so this is probably uh, where we started our precision ag journey. It's probably just started with phosphorus. Um so we just started with standard replacement P, which four kilos of P per ton of um Cereals removed and seven units of a P for lentils and canola. And that's actually quite high. Like it's a uh, C test wouldn't use that much, but we uh, probably use it as an example just to make sure we've got a bit of a buffer. Um, but we're sort of finding that these uh, zones of the paddock were becoming uh, P deficient. And um, we're just sort of wondering what's going on there. And um, this is a bit of a data from my agronomist, Sam Trengrove. He's a, uh, very good at this kind of stuff. So these are just uh, um, all these, like quite a few soil tests that that he's um, done over multiple farms in the area. We're sort of finding that, um, yeah. So yeah, where I'll go with this, um, yeah. So we a pH map the whole farm. So we pH map the whole farm. We're finding that these areas. So this the bottom one is a is the pH of the soil measured via Verus. So Verus is a machine that comes in and samples probably every 20 meters go up and down your tram lines every 20 meters and you get a nice pH map, but sort of finding that, yeah, PBI is directly correlated to pH in our, in our landscape. Um, so, you know, as soon as we start getting over six and a half, PBI starts to, to ramp up. And um, then this is a DGT, Colwell P pretty much useless in our country. We find that PBIs are so variable, variable that Colwell is pretty, whereas DGT is a bit more accurate. Um, and then this is a little, uh, formula that we've that the agronomist has come up with um basically ph and ndvi sort of brought together and so we can see that dgt has got a reasonable correlation with um the ph and the ndvi when that when they're brought together so we set up trials four four zones in the paddock just to validate that and we're sort of finding that um on these uh higher ph areas um sort of the most profitable fertilizer rate would be 50 units of p so that's a lot of, that's like north of 200 kilos of MAP, which no one's doing at all. So, 
And we're finding our SE can't actually pump that out. We can only get a 150 kilos before we have to get another tank metering going. So um, yeah, so we're really ramping up these rates on um, on these areas. They might they might um, so probably a general fertilizer use is not going up. So we're sort of stealing it from the acidic areas and 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 putting it on the uh, alkaline areas. Then uh, Mr. Putin came along, decided to, uh, yeah, cause a war and, uh, and even just the COVID aftermath that yeah, fertilizer prices went through the roof. So then we sort of just decided, well, you know, do we like, you know, in the past, we've just been applying 80 to 100 kilos of MAP blanket rate over the farm. But before we started doing this, um, surely some of these zones that there's no response to P, we've, we've got a P bank. So we thought, well, let's... um rather than paying $1,500 a tonne for MAP and just kind of wasting it on some of these areas, we sort of thought we'll just sharpen it up. And in the first year we saved a full road train load of, um, of MAP over the, over what our, what our standard rates would have been. So that was hundred grand bang. Um, so where I'm up to, um, yeah. So instead of doing that replacement, we would, repl so with part of this, the previous maps we'd be doing, we'd have a replacement, on these acidic areas that don't really respond, we just want to replace. Where so we so we thought well, because we've got a P bank, just cut that out. We just put some, you know, maybe thirty kilos of MAP down the tube, just to keep it, um, just to give it something out of the ground. Not that all the trial work says that very minimal response on those areas, but you just can't really bring yourself to not put any fertilizer on on those areas. And this is just a um little bit of a uh, prof, uh economics calculator. So. Plug in the at the time we did this at four hundred dollars a ton at APW. Barley was three hundred odd, um, and then the fertilizer price I think it was fifteen hundred dollars a ton. I can't really see it there, but it must be somewhere. Um, yeah, so it's just sort of what's the optimum P rate um, at certain prices, either oh, prices down the side. So yeah, um, probably won't really go into this too much. Don't need to be preaching to the choir in WA about line program, but. Um, yeah, we're uh, because we've done the various mapping over the whole farm. We know the pH everywhere, so we can just really target those areas. So, where over here, I sort of understand that pretty much whole paddocks maybe acidic, and you just sort of blanket rate. Well, yeah, we've got areas out there for seven and a half, and yeah, you do not want to be putting lime on those areas because you're just going to get a negative response. So, um, yeah, we putting two ton, two tonne of the hectare to lift it um by one unit, which is pretty stock standard. But um, yeah, where we our sands have a um, I think it's called buffering index, but basically you can change the pH easier on a sand than you can a heavy soil. So we thought, oh, we, we should actually account for that. But then we do actually have, that's that's where we have it at depth. So like the pH issues at depth. So we just ignored that and we've just gone out with treating. So yeah, treating uh, the sand. But now Sam's uh, really uh, trying to get super smart. And I think he's starting out, out to grow where I'm at, but he's um yeah, doing some ground truthing uh and trying to predict that stratification um of pH. So because you can't you know, the virus just can't go down to 30 centimeters um well unless without some engineering. But so uh yeah that's where we're going now with just sort of predicting uh due to soil type pH if the if the topsoil is below five and a half and it's a sand generally we've got issues at depth. So yeah, these rates of fertilizer of uh, lime could be going up to eight or nine tons to the hectare and then other parts of the paddock are getting absolutely nothing. But generally our probably paddock average would be about two and a half tons to the hectare on average. So um, yeah, and we just have completed the, the liming program, which we've just been focusing heavily over the last few years. But because we um, have uh, issues at depth, um, we got some uh, inclusion plates made up by um yeah we helped worked with the unisa to design these um well they they they're the brains and we just adopted their uh their idea so there's actually a little bit of science behind inclusion plates um which you know you wouldn't really think but and some people would argue oh you know who cares but when you you bump sitting on that seat for the amount of hours that you are like and the actual the advice that we've had since we've made these is probably changed a little bit so we'll for the sake of a thousand bucks to buy another, to get another set made up, we're going to change because thousand dollars is a day worth of diesel. So any sort of the idea with these is longer and travel faster to get the same level of inclusion. This little cut up 
cut out underneath here um, in, in improves drag. Um, since these, this was with this was when I first bolted them on. Since now, now we actually run them a little bit higher because when you break out the soil here, the um, yeah, there's drag here. So so just have them up a little bit higher, and then you can actually drop the whole time down deeper. But you need a level of um, soil above, obviously, for the plate to work. Um, yeah, so the idea is we lime the paddock in year one and then um, just incorporate that with a cedar to try and get a higher level of alkaline soil in the top. Find that if you – our lime's not great. It's a bit coarse. Probably doesn't move very well. Um, so we'll try and incorporate it with the air cedar to just get a, a more uniform alkaline layer rather than just having super hot spots of lime. Because once we drop that in, an, in, in, a, in a slot, it ain't moving. So if we can just have a, a higher level body of alkaline soil, that sort of helps us. But yeah, um, and we're just trying to, we've had a few disasters with, uh, and we're still still working through it, but just, we're just doing wheat stubbles in front of a barley. We don't grow a heap of barley. So it's if we grow a barley crop, we just have to rip in front of it because it's an opportunity that we can't let go missing. Um, it's probably it for that. Um, yeah, urea, that's the one that I struggle with the most, but it's the most economic one to do. Um, but I find extreme extreme years, whether it be extreme dry or extreme wet, make fantastic yield maps. So I find that um, the plant knows more about the soil than we do. So you can EM map, you can do whatever you want, but really like it takes a lot of interpretation. Well, the plant does all the interpretation for you if you get the right season. So, um, yeah, I find myself going back to yield maps from five years ago because I know that crop was in that paddock at that um, that type of season and, and using that for zones. Um, yeah, so dry year, in our instance, the sands is, sand is the best part of the paddock. It's got the lowest uh, deep end soil level. So we need to push those soils hard in a, in a, in a dry year, in, like, yeah, in relation to the flats. And then in the, flat, the flats in a dry year, basically just leave them because they, uh, they've got enough so They've got enough soil and generally with our legumes in the rotation to sort of look after themselves and and they're sort of water limited generally. Um, wet years, it's sort of harder to predict. We quite often will go out with a blanket rate of urea in the first pass just to let the season develop and sort of work out what we're doing. Um, and then the second pass becomes the sort of deciding factor. So if we've, this year, for instance, we've actually just done another blanket rate because our sands have really struggled with the dry July, which is not usual for them. We just couldn't store the water, um, but uh, yeah, other years, normal a normal dry year, we would then be ramping up the rates just to try and top them up. Um, and sort of, a, I'll talk about it probably a bit at the end, but I'm sort of trying to adopt a bit of an NBank approach now. We've got a protein machine and I think that there's some, yeah, we're going to get a protein map after harvest and then we're going to deep end soil test and see if we can find a correlation because if there's higher protein in the soil, uh, protein in the grain, on a certain area of the paddock, we're sort of saying, we're suggesting, well, there's probably been some leftover N that we can exploit the following year. Uh, this was just another little example of something we've done um, lentil seeding rate. Um, so we're pushing these lentils on the sands really hard to try and improve them. And then we've uh, like, this is up here, sort of this part of the paddocks. Um, they grow fantastic lentils. You, you just want to get down on, take a photo, I'll put them up on Instagram and, and uh, yeah, they really grow well, good lentils, but come the header comes along. It's just, they're just terrible. Like they just grow fantastic. They don't flower like for ages. I think the lentils think, oh, I've got all the nutrition in the world here. I'm not going to uh, produce anything for a while. Like I can just grow more vegetative stuff and then a hot north wind comes along or maybe there's some boring real down at depth and, and they just go nothing. So we're really winding our seeding rates back on these areas. So 25 kilos a hectare is, is, is plenty. Like they look a bit sparse come early, but yeah and the other thing is is this is where the disease starts too the botrytis grain mold is pretty bad in lentils and yeah that these heavy areas they that's where it all starts and you're not treating the whole paddock for these areas and the rest of it so if you can delay a bit of canopy closure on these areas that's it's advantageous as well bit of manure um yeah so just basically on the sands put a bit of manure on we've got two options biosolids um which is basically a human like a straight out adelaide but it's i say that's not human poo it's very uh well uh you're buying something from the government it's very well uh, treated and and whatnot it's um two percent n two percent p dense product great you know if trucks driving straight past you can just load it in a normal road train it's, it's free 
just the freight and bring it home. Chicken manure is another thing. It's big in, big in our area. Um, it's definitely more effective. I think the issue with biosolids is there's a bit of heavy metals in it that tie up some of the nutrition, whereas chicken manure doesn't have any of that. It's got a bit more organic matter. It's got a bit more N2, but it's we're finding it's increasing non-wetting. So that's just a real big red flag for us. Just non-wetting is getting worse and worse in our farming system, and we're putting out something that's making it worse. So it's got to be some big questions there, whether or not we just have to slot it behind a – yeah, we basically need to incorporate it if we're going to use it. But it's forty dollars a ton now. Farmers are in demand of it, and it's pretty expensive. Bit of stuff for frost management. So um, we've got low lying areas in the paddocks uh, in this June swales that traps cold air. You can't let it flow out. So um, a few different options. Historically, district practices do nothing. Just you know, who cares? You can't you can't plan for frost. Whereas in our environment, if we delay flowering from the late August to to the first week of September, you reduce your frost risk by fifty percent. That's just your standard sort of climate data. Um, so then then the next option is just to delay sowing, but that's reducing the yield potential on the rest of the paddock. Some, some of these paddocks, only 20% of the paddocks getting frosted. So then the third option is is we um, identify the areas and that can be a little bit uh, hard elevation maps or or just previous yield maps that get frosted. But um, yeah, but they're pretty clear. It's the flats in a, in a low lying area. And we saw a winter wheat there. So that's a, a wheat that just sits there, goes vegetative, doesn't uh, has to get a cold requirement before it's um before it goes up to head. So shouldn't get frosted in that respect. But I think, but I like the idea of rather than just delaying sowing, I like the idea is because you actually start your root exploration. You can really tap into any deep moisture, but you can't do that every year. So sometimes we get a late start. We can't use that winter wheat. So we'll go with a three way. Um, mix so like catapult set for a caliber of fantastic varieties they're all the same seed breeder so there's there's no real issues with EPRs um, yeah and they just all flower at different different timing so probably you probably can't see much of the picture but on the right hand side there is um is a ben, is Bennett wheat which is like a which is low lying very just winter in it's and then to the other side it's probably, it's probably I can't remember but it was probably a scepter so um where where to start if you're having a crack at um VR, I, yeah, I'm a big believer of yield maps are better than NDVI. NDVI is just a snapshot. It, it, NDVI is, is definitely useful, um, but early on, yeah, sometimes something can be happening early on and it doesn't always translate to yield. So um, depending on what you're looking for, but I'm a really big believer of yield maps and it's, it's a good way. Just farmers, everyone's got yield maps now. It's, um, yeah, it's 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 not confronting for people to to get, in, get into, but um, yeah, keep it simple, give it a go. It won't be perfect the first time. Like um, some people just sit back and they don't want to adopt it because they think they pick holes in what you're doing. Well, it doesn't matter. Just if you do something, it's better than nothing. Like, it, yeah, it won't be perfect the first time, but every time you'll get better and you slowly refine the system. Um, what ne What's next for us? Um, compaction mapping. Got a fella out there. I don't know if he's actually been out there yet. I'm not super excited about it because he's going to put tracks all through my lentils, but he's uh gonna he's got a thing on the back of his little uav and he's gonna compaction map the farm and uh, this paddock and just see how he's gonna go with uh sort of trying to measure compaction um yeah investigating this n bacon protein machine data correlation little one percenter that um want to try is uh, lightning lentils there's lightning and thunder are the two new lentil varieties that everyone's pretty excited about lightning are far better on sands thunder is um just the is the good variety everywhere um so we're gonna got three bins we're going to run lightning in one box thunder in the other and just as we go over hills we'll just transition from different varieties it's probably not all that important but lightning is a uh, very very um grows out and whereas the thunder grows a bit more erect and upright so i think it'll work well for a disease management perspective um and you just want to leave our soils um, in better shape for the next generation so that's all for me. Um, yeah, if you want to get in touch, there's a few social media things you can get in touch with me or come visit. Or if you want to fancy yourself as a farmer, come to a season with us. So thanks, Dave. So time for one quick question. I'm just interested in your farm plan values and where you see them going back to yeah so it's an interesting one i had a bit of a crack at some uh, it's a bit contrary to that slide i had a bit of a crack at some land just last week didn't get it just because my calculator probably wasn't uh 
as good as someone else's. Um, yeah, I don't know where it's. I mean, it's definitely not, especially with interest rates where they where they are at the moment. It's definitely can't even think about paying the interest. With I, yeah, I keep saying to my brother, saying to my brother in law, he's in a completely different industry. I sort of say, oh, uh, loan prices they'll come off soon. They've, they've just got a flat plateau, and he's he's just said to me the other day, he said, "You've been saying that for ten years." So like, I think it's such, such an emotional uh, growers are um, emotional. Um, yeah, bit of an ego thing. They want to buy more land. Yeah, there's no economics to it anymore. I don't think. And but yeah, where they're going, I think they'll just continue to grow and. Because yeah, that well, I thought it was sort of double every ten years. Or in that graph, they sort of doubled in the last five. Mm. Yeah, so I know, I'd, and this land that I was looking at purchasing was slightly out of my area, and I was just purchasing it purely because I know some farmland is going to come up in my area in the next five, and I thought, well, I want to be riding that elevator rather than um, trying to get on the elevator in t two or three, four, five years time. When is it going to even be even worth even more? Okay. Thanks, James. Thank you. Uh, next presentation this morning is from Colin Bettle. So Colin's going to give us an update on the um, uh, code of practice for the agricultural mobile field machinery with autonomous functions in Australia. Um, sharing the, the two arrows. That. Okay. Just like that. There we go. All right. Thanks for that. And uh, I just want to start off by saying thanks to the presenters who've been on before me today. I found each of them extremely interesting and engaging and uh, in particular learning how to increase productivity and profitability and sustainability on the farm, which is pretty much everything GPA is about as well. So I um, also want to acknowledge uh, Phil, president of SPA. Um, keep up the fantastic work, mate. You're one of the great quiet achievers of our industry. And I love what you do. And also, Angelique, for your work uh, that you've done recently in supporting what we're doing with the Code of uh, Practice, working together in our recent application, which I'll talk more about la later on in the presentation, but also just enjoying working with you and your positive attitude and support for GPA. So thank you. Um, Crane Producers Australia. So I'll just give a bit of background on who we are, first of all. Um, you may have seen a variation of this presentation before from Dr. Rowan Rainbow, so I'd like to acknowledge Rowan's uh, changed his role with GPA. He's been an integral part of what we've uh, been doing and uh, his support's been amazing. He's changed his role now. He's freeing things up a bit, uh, moving up to Queensland and, um, and looking to uh, spend a bit more time with family up there as well. But he's been integral in developing the, the code of practice as well and some of the other support for our what we do at GPA with uh, technology and in particular um, pesticide application on farm. Um, which way do I point this thing there? Right. There we go. Okay, so our primary role is representing Australian grain producers on national policy and advocacy. Uh, GPA replaced the Grains Council of Australia in about 2008. You may remember a little thing called the uh, Wheat for Weapons scandal, and that had multiple impacts across the Australian uh, grains industry uh, when they deregulated the AWV single desk. Uh, the Grains Council of Australia also folded, but there were critical functions under legislation representing growers, in particular all growers who pay levies. Uh, and I've outlined them there, uh, GRDC, Plant Health Australia and the National Residue Survey. Um, so uh, there was a, um, a, a series of roundtable meetings where Australian grains industry leaders uh, come up with the GPA model. And uh, we still have two founding directors uh, on the board, Andrew Wiedemann and Barry Large, who farms in up around uh, Mora in the WA Wheat Belt, very um, passionate about representing growers uh, where they're a volunteer board and they put in an incredible amount of their own time representing their peers over the years and helping to guide GPA to where we are today. Um, our members include state farming organisations, their grains committees and direct grower members. So those state farming organisations include, for example, WA Farmers and the WA Grains Group over here and New South Wales Farmers 
uh, and uh, Victorian Farmers Federation, et cetera. So essentially people who pay to be members of their state farming groups and want to be represented on grains policy and advocacy. Uh, we're also a not-for-profit, so any profit we make is reinvested back into policy and advocacy, which I like to call profit for purpose. And ultimately our aim is boosting grower productivity and profitability and sustainability. Now, we work with GRDC uh, in a particular way. Uh, we're involved in board appointments and we have regular consultation meetings uh, where we talk about pretty high level issues. We do get into some areas of management if our uh, grower members want us to take things up in, in particular, like how our national variety trials are managed, but we try and keep it pretty high level. And we also um, share that role with the grain growers. Uh, who also represent growers on national policy. Um, and there are uh, overlaps with how we interact with the Department of Agriculture and the Minister's Office to make those things happen. I keep going backwards here. Sorry, that's what's wrong. <laughs> so we have six grower directors. Uh, there's two northern, uh, that's essentially uh, New South Wales and Queensland. Southern is Victoria and South Australia. And then two in the West and two skills-based independent directors being Peter Bridgman and uh, Mitchell Hook, who's an experienced um, uh, advocate across uh, a number of industries, not just agriculture, but also mining and, and a pioneer of sustainability. Um, our policy council representatives, of, effectively our policy council, we have those state members, their president sit on our policy council. And we have a number of subcommittees that support the policy council with uh, biosecurity, sustainability, pesticides and technology, and also the professional policy managers from the states working to make sure we're maintaining momentum uh, with those particular policy areas that we're working on. We've got a, a small team of professional staff uh, and our, ultimately we get out of bed every day. We've got a dollar, a sp dollar to spend and we, we look at doing what we can to deliver for growers and in particular our members uh, and their priorities. Uh, we manage a number of projects as part of our not-for-profit role uh, there's a grain sustainability framework that's been underway for a, a couple of years. It's been led by grain growers. That's in a process of being recalibrated at the moment. And our board will discuss that later this month. Um, we also do a number of uh, initiatives on biosecurity um, in our role with Plant Health Australia. But that's something we recently did with um, the shooting Shooters of Australia, I'll just call it that, yeah, double S, double A, but essentially to raise awareness about, in particular, the feral pig problem in the eastern states and, and hunters before they go on properties, just making sure they're doing the right thing. Uh, we're, we're trying to get the animal rights activists to have similar uh, acknowledgement before they put their cameras in piggeries um, as they're a biosecurity risk, but that's another argument altogether. Um so we also have the Code of Practice for Autonomous Farm Machinery, and we're proud to be working in partnership there with SPA and also the Tractor and Machinery Association of Australia. And as you saw last night, uh, Brad Hogg is our National Mental Health Ambassador, and our partners there are New Farm Grain Growers come on board this year, uh, Rural Aid and Lifeline as well. So we're proud of that, and we think that getting out there and destigmatising uh, mental health, uh, getting people talking about it and destigmatizing things like uh, suicide prevention, we think is a positive step. And we're going to look next year, I think, to connect with other national groups more strategically to take that to the next level. Uh, in the meantime, um, Hoggy's out there talking at the field days and doing a great job on the ground, just talking to people and getting the message out there. Uh, we also, with our new farm partnership, we have a Paddock to Parliament scholarship program. Uh, not a big one, but again, just that... Uh, the subtleties of the GPA role, talking about uh, advocacy and what it actually is, and that uh, we're all advocates in our own way, but uh, we have specific roles and, and there's a specific way of putting policy together and advocating that and how you deal with the media and and uh, God bless the federal parliament as well, or even in uh, at a state level, So, which is a key to what um, we do at GPA. Um, we also, and I think this is a tribute to Andrew Wiedemann and also to Rowan or Dr. Rowan Rainbow, but we've had a, an emergency use permit for ZP50 mouse bait, uh, which is the result of long-term research between GRDC, CSRO. Uh, we have a number of manufacturers on our permit and that work's come through the National Mouse Management Group, which Andrew Wiedemann is the chair and connecting with Dr. Steve Henry from CSIRO. It all sounds simple on the surface that we've got a now a double dose zinc phosphate phosphide uh, mouse bait option out there that growers are able to access. But the industry permits is something that's now being managed through GPA 
uh, under a, a permit or a uh, service agreement with Grains Australia. So without those uh, options in place it would make it a lot more difficult uh, for growers to manage particular pests or or uh, diseases on the farm. So we really respond to the needs of our members. I think last year we put something together. There was a crop disease roundtable in South Australia and we responded with a, a permit that allowed for a, a control of powdery mildew in wheat. And so they're the sort of things that GPA is also involved in. Um, our election policy priorities document in the 2022 federal election, I started in May 2021, and I think we needed to start preparing for the reality of a potential change in government, and that meant an impact on uh, their different attitude, obviously, around climate and sustainability, and what that meant for growers, and just starting to put, to put a policy document together uh, that would start a conversation uh, with a new government, potentially, but also recognising that the co coalition could have been re-elected. Uh, GPA is apolitical. We want the best outcomes for growers. Uh, we don't um, make any donations or payments to any political parties. We engage across the aisles uh, to get the best outcomes for growers. So that's essentially the blueprint or the template that we're working on with this new parliament to get the best outcomes we can for growers. Some of the key things in there, there's 12 headline priorities. Farm labour was a big issue leading into the 21-22 harvest. Uh, pricing disparity for grains, uh, that hasn't been, uh, we haven't been popular with the grain traders because of that one, but that's a policy of our members that we've advocated and we've had multiple conversations with the minister. Uh, high input prices, so we've been calling for more local uh, production of, for example, green fertilisers uh, in particular at the moment. We've seen on the East Coast, difficulty with people getting hold of urea and a number of other big plays with a potential sale of IPL, for example, that gives us a chance to advocate our policy position. So I won't bore you with too much of the rest of it, but obviously these things go to the, the heart of the profitability and sustainability of growers, and that's why we're doing it. Uh, background on the autonomy code of practice. Um, as I mentioned before, Rowan's been integral integral to driving this uh, and the partnership with TMA and SPA has been critical. Um, I'll, I won't talk to every little element of the slide uh, that we've got in there, but um, this has been supported through our pesticides and technology subcommittee. So that's where we're engaging growers. Uh, the process started in 2019 and, uh, and the code is for infield on-farm operation only. Um, excludes UAVs, remote controlled and fixed autonomous infrastructure, uh, does not cover, cover the use of autonomous or semi-autonomous equipment for on-road use or on public land. Now, I have stolen some of these from Rowan, so I won't have his uh, level of technical expertise in these, these areas, but also as the author of the Code of Practice as well, he was involved in those discussions. Um, and he's given regular updates, I think, through this forum as well and, and through other um, processes um, it was based essentially on a, a code of practice for mining in Western Australia. So that was the template we worked off and it also combined other documents that we've had. Growing Australian Grains is something GPA was involved in across the industry that really put stewardship and be best practice at the forefront of grain production. Um, here's a, a rough sketch of some of the work that went in behind the scenes and the meetings that went place uh, took place and some of the engagement that Rowan did to, to bring it together. Um, here's the scope and application, some of the legislative obligations, for example, Safe Work Australia model, um, safety laws, uh, Ag Vet Chemicals Code, um, and it's aligned with ISO standards for as, as well. So someone with Rowan's expertise was able to put this together and uh, through an inclusive process, work with the draft until it was finalised, which pretty much coincided with when I started in May 2021. And, and one of the first uh, jobs we did was to um, present the final code to the West Australian government for their formal adoption and endorsement. Uh, and um, I think one of the first things they did uh, was we obviously briefed a number of people relevant to the adoption of this code, giving them a, a background that we based this off the mining autonomous machinery code in Western Australia. Uh, and um, so we had a number of conversations. So the initial response was positive. Part of that also, uh, as part of our protocols, we engage with our state member. Uh, so with WA Farmers, we approached the WA government. We had a number of meetings and wrote to the relevant ministers as well. And they encouraged us uh, for being uh, proactive with some of the community uh, concerns around safety 
as well. But uh, unfortunately, it's gone uh, into a little bit of a vortex within the WA government. I won't go into too much detail, but while I'm here in Western Australia, we'll be having more meetings to try and decipher what it is they're actually saying. Um, but I think essentially they're saying that they don't really see the need for an industry specific code of practice and that they're going to have more generic codes. Um, I'm actually would be surprised if anyone in the government's actually read the code of practice and picked it up and done anything with it. Most of the complaint back to me is that they've been lacking resources and uh, that they've kind of using this as a, a as an argument to say that they're overworked and they don't have the expertise to analyse it and do anything with it, which really contradicts the message. Uh, the expectation they've created all along from our initial discussions two years ago that they would be looking to adopt it. Um, and they actually asked us to write back and request that it was okay for us to uh, confirm that it was a living document and it could be drafted and updated. They outlined the process clearly. And now two years later, I think it's been sitting on someone's desk and they've, uh, between ministerial correspondence and ministerial responses, responses, Nothing's happened. Uh, the new minister, Jackie Jarvis, when she started, obviously we wrote to her just to remind her uh, that this was in, in play, uh, which was a responsible move. And um, we, we received a response saying that she would follow up uh, with the relevant department, uh, the WorkSafe Commissioner. There was also an inquiry into farm safety in Western Australia that got a lot of headlines and a few sound bites for, for the minister and others. Um, and we also submitted to that inquiry highlighting that we were being proactive with farm safety um, and that autonomous farm machinery is on the horizon. It's going to a lot arrive, arrive a lot sooner than we realise. I think uh, Rowan sent me some numbers to support this presentation. The market for or the global market for autonomous farm machinery is going to be something like 300 billion by 2027. And it's not just the grains industry here that are using autonomous farm machinery as well. The reason why I think it's a good project working, GPA working with TMA and SPA from a political point of view, you've got the growers there, the users of the technology with the people who'll be manufacturing it as well. And then uh, the preci precision agriculture, the practical application of this in the paddock to deliver outcomes like sustainability and uh, improve productivity, never mind the, the, the savings, the practical benefits to farmers of, of farm labour and increasing their productivity as well. Uh, that for, for having those three voices in the conversation, I think working together, um, we're saving the government a lot of time and effort with this. We've, we've gift wrapped it, we put it in a red bow and it's sitting on someone's desk there waiting to be picked up. Um, and and that's fair enough. Maybe when this machinery arrives in a hurry, it'll be, it'll be one of those things that it's just dormant and they'll be able to pick it up and run with it as well. So I think we can afford to be patient but we need to be persistent with our discussions with the government. And uh, in the meantime, our members are recognising that things had slowed down a bit in Western Australia, that our members in Queensland as well started engagement with their government in February 2023. And um, I think those discussions, it's safe to say, are very preliminary at this stage. Um, while this was going on... Um, we also commenced a stage two project. And I think that's when I came on board that we looked at what we were doing here and said that we can probably do a lot more than a code of practice. Uh, we can probably look at this and saying, well, what is actually gonna happen with autonomous uh, farm machinery? And what are the important elements of, of this technology for producers and across the industry? And what are the other areas of this that we need to start thinking about? So Rowan um, put together a, a stage two project, which really looked at um, how do we do this, do it once and do it right? Obviously, gaining funding partners was a key to pro, uh, maintaining momentum over a four-year period. Uh, TMA and SPA came on board straight away and supported what we were doing. And um, essentially, we put in a, a, an application for funding to GRDC, uh, as most people do. GRDC, I think in Latin, means ATM for, for the grains industry. Um, but that's the same with most RDCs. Uh, so we again, we thought we were being proactive with the safety elements, but also the technology and productivity benefits for growers more importantly, and looking down the track and saying, well, this technology is arriving. What do we need to do to build, for example, community acceptance? Um, these are Rowan's notes. I've completely plagiarised them. Um, but uh, I think these are still relevant. This is from his presentation last year. So these core principles still remain strong to what we're doing. Um and here we are now, uh, again, this is what I mentioned before, Angelique's been fantastic working with um, 
with uh, my team in putting together an application for an EOI submission. Uh, Rowan's intelligence on this essentially that GRDC has now come out with a funding program, the Grains Automate program, which um, I think they've taken a lot of the elements of what we've uh, presented to them as a funding proposal and recognise the importance there. So they've got their um, procurement processes that they need to go through and uh, that's fair enough. Uh, this is the just the very high level overview of what they're aiming to achieve, paving the way for autonomy, targeted technology development and building intelligent systems. Um, there's a national coordination role um, to go with that as well. And um, uh, well, really it was Spa who did a lot of the work working with Michael Gilbert on my team to put this in last Friday. So while Angelique was pulling together this conference with her team as well, she pulled together this um, submission as well. So thank you for that. And uh, we hope that we have some good news to report on that. I'm sure GRDC is going to come back with the request for more information or more clarification. Um, but there's plenty of opportunity out there for us to get out and build from my point of view, GPA critical role around community acceptance. And one of the areas that we've um, uh, starting to work much more collaboratively with grain growers um, on some of these opportunities as well. So they're now looking at autonomy as well and seeing how they can get behind what GPA is doing, including on the code of practice as well. So that's another partner that will help build momentum. But, uh, you know, things like um, understanding why we need, well, why growers or how growers will benefit from the use of this technology and uh, and why safety is important and what are the productivity gains to be had and getting out ahead of this um, technology's arrival here in Australia. Um, in finishing off, this is a, a QR code and I'm encouraging everyone to, uh, as we had last night, the flyers on the table. This is uh, the competition we're running for our mental health initiative. Um, our theme, which Hoggy forgot to mention last night, is the importance of taking a break this year. Um, and last year, it was about the importance of staying connected with your mates and people in your community. So um, I'm encouraging everyone, while, while it's up there on the screen, take a shot, enter the competition. It's free. You'll win a holiday. But most importantly, we've all worked pretty hard the last couple of years with some big harvests. We're probably going to work just as hard in a tough year that's finishing off pretty dry in many parts of the country as well. You, you know, you don't work any less than uh, when it's uh, a tough year than you do when it's a big year with plenty of grain as well. So just our theme this year is make sure you take a break, whether it's a short break or a long break, but I think there's five grains worth of holidays to be had um, and be good to plan a holiday um, next year sometime and, and step back from the farm. That's it. Any questions? I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Our last uh, presentation for the morning is from Liam Ryan. Uh, Liam's from uh, GRDC and is going as the acting senior manager for enabling technologies and is going to give us an update. Thanks, Liam. Thanks. Again. All righty, morning, Good morning, everyone. I should stand here in front of the mic. So I, um, I'm just going to take 10 minutes to give a bit of an overview from GRDC about some high-level things in terms of the RD&E plan. A couple of things or key initiatives in the portfolio around precision ag and um, Colin's already paved the way for part of the discussion around automation and that. So thank you. Thank you, Colin. Uh, and then a bit at the end as well around some sort of key challenges that we're seeing in terms of what's coming through the pipeline from an rd &E perspective in Precision Ag, but then what are probably some of the rate limiting steps as well in terms of, you know, getting that pull through to adoption, which we're really focused on. So a couple of bits on the rd &E plan. Uh, it was launched in July this year at the Australian Grains Industry Conference. I won't spend too much going on it or talking about it here. It's on the website for those interested in precision ag rd &E and a grains perspective in particular. Uh, please have a look, download it. It talks a lot to the background around why the plan is structured the way that it is. But importantly, some key aspects of the signalling around reaching new frontiers in that plan and areas that we really want to grow in. A couple of key features on that plan, though. So it does have, like most GRDC at five-year plans, a strong balance between maintaining sort of capacity or aspects of BAU that are still going to be important in the portfolio. But a big, far, is a, a big part is really around looking at new opportunities, right? So transforming the efficiency of input use, which naturally leads to precision ag and opportunities there. But it's also just the uplift that we have in the RD&E spend, you know, so coming off a couple of great years in 21, 22, 
Um, GRDC more broadly, like most RDCs, you know, operates on a really strong positive feedback loop. If we're doing our job well, we're getting R&D, getting growers' farms, that's resulting in bigger crops, bigger levies. It gives us the opportunity to reinvest and then go further and harder. And so uplifting from approximately the $180 million annual investment in RDE to 230 from here on in uh, provides a great opportunity to look at some of those new horizon opportunities in Precision Ag. Uh, on the RDNE plan, it's basically comprised of four pillars and a range of focus areas within those pillars. Again, I won't spend too much time going into this because I want to get to the nitty gritty of what the Precision Ag portfolio currently looks like. And again, sort of um, provide a bit of awareness around that. Uh, but just quickly, so harnessing existing potential, yeah, it's really around growers hitting their yield and profit targets across every paddock and every season. We think there's still a lot of room to create value for growers there in alignment with GRDC's purpose. So that's really sort of the aspects of BAU around, you know, weed, pest and disease control, agronomy, farming systems, soils and nutrition, and where a big part of the investment is going to be. But the reaching new frontiers pillar, that's particularly important and the sort of stuff that gets people in GRDC or in particular people like myself, and I would think hopefully a lot of people in this room as well, particularly excited about where we could head in Precision Ag. So that's really around, you know, exceeding productivity gains that we currently thought were possible. Um, we're looking at things in step changes in soil and water productivity, unlocking plant potential. So around things like resource use efficiency, uh, but also, like I said earlier, transforming efficiency of, of input use. Uh, there's various mechanisms to do that, but obviously we look at precision ag and then aspects of autonomy as well as key enablers for that. Uh, a quick shout out as well, because it's probably not as pertinent, I guess, to a room focused on precision ag, uh, but in growing markets and capturing value, we think there's strategic opportunities to invest as well to help create enduring profitability for growers in that pillar, but also in terms of thriving for future generations. So that's around making sure the Australian grains industry is still well positioned to be a global leader in sustainable grain production. Uh, again, I've just, I think I mentioned this earlier, but a couple of key things on the RD&E plan, knowing that higher value opportunities, you know, those that take a, we're, we're really trying to target new frontiers and realize those step change gains inherently are associated with greater risk. And that could be technical risk, commercial or adoption risk, whatever it might be, but it's a strong part of the signaling in the plan. Like we're willing and able to look at those opportunities and I think much greater than we did in the previous plan. And a big part of that is going to be focused on those sort of bluer sky opportunities. Uh, thank you, Colin. You've already sort of uh, warmed the oven, I think, on my discussion on paving the way. Um, but I'll just spend a couple of minutes on this because this is one of these key initiatives within the new rd &E plan around transforming the efficiency of input use. This has been a lot of time brewing in GRDC, talking with various experts from academia, industry, the major original equipment, equipment manufacturers, including key product people based in North America and Europe. And a lot of this plan, when you think about how do we generate impact for growers in machine autonomy and what we're sort of thinking about is intelligent systems, is based on the recognition as well, like most things in GRDC, like we're a small market for a lot of agricultural technologies and that has implications in terms of when we see products come to our market, but also the fit that they have in Australian grain cropping systems. And with autonomy more broadly, although there's been significant private investment in the technology stacks to enable automation of different tasks, it's not just the tech, like to the point that Colin made, it's all around the stewardship, the regulatory frameworks as well, having community acceptance for autonomy. They're all pieces that are really important to have to ensure that there's a functioning and sustainable value chain to help build on the base that we can create or GRDC can create with others uh, in machine autonomy. Just quickly around these three programs, so we're structuring this as basically a interconnected portfolio of RDNE projects uh, in these three different programs, paving the way for autonomy. A really big focus around that is going to be how do we help uh, create effectively a more adoption ready market for autonomy, thinking about foundational precision ag technologies are really enablers for more advanced applications of machine automation. And so that's a great opportunity for people in this room and SPA and others as well is it's not just sort of precision ag and sort of helping others get uplift to the same extent that so, you know, Bindi and Topo and others are around things like VRT and yield mapping. It's those things are also stepping stones that we see in terms of more advanced applications of automation and the point where you can profitably and safely remove an operator from the cab with a lot the likes of Deer, CNH and Raven and others have through their roadmaps. Uh, targeted technology development. That's sort of another area of R&D for us. Again, that's based on the recognition that the major OEMs in particular, but also other startups and SMEs have invested significant amounts of private dollars developing those technology stacks for different task automation or aspects of task automation. 
But again, you know, a tillage operation with offset disks in the Midwest for corn and soy systems is going to look very different in terms of, you know, an operating environment in Australian grain cropping systems. <clears throat> so that's where we think there's an opportunity and a need for GRDC to almost look at co-investing in that last mile sort of technical adaptation with, you know, uh, key players in machine automation to help ensure that we get great fits uh, for all products and autonomy for Australian grain growers and they really hit the need. And then thinking about the last sort of uh, program <clears throat> in building intelligent systems, this is about sort of thinking beyond just the point of having an automated task on farm, where how do we actually create more automation in data workflows, you know, to machines, back to the office, but across the farming system as well in thinking about logistics and then to some extent as well, data flows pre and post gate where they make sense. And a big focus of this, of course, in terms of this interconnected program is, is sort of playing the long game. Like we're conscious around the value that we want to create with autonomy and where we could head. It's there and it's clear in front of us, but it also requires, you know, a strategic effort and persistence over time. Uh, just a quick shout out as well to what else we've got going on in Precision Ag. So we've kind of got the traditional pipeline in GRDC where R&D projects that tend to be a bit further upstream, you know, typically led by universities, research organisations, more so in Precision Ag and a lot of other private companies as well. Some major corporates, startups and SMEs. But the venture fund as well is a really nice complementary mechanism where we have startups, a lot of which are focused on precision ag, uh, and just providing them with the capital they need to help scale with a great product in the Australian market for Australian growers is a really nice mechanism for us to have. And we've seen a lot of those really do some really interesting, impactful things and, and have really great roadmaps in front of them. Uh, I'm just checking how I'm going for time. Um, <clears throat> a bit of a shout out to the current portfolio in terms of some key projects that are in here currently. So um, I think a couple of them have already been talked to from the group at University of Sydney. So Tom, Brett and Pat's team. Um, we're looking at things like, so plan available water. So different modeling methods or scalable methods that can be parameterized with input layers readily available on farm or off farm for mapping the depth of plan available water at different depth increments. As part of that, getting a good estimate of PAWC as well, spatially at different scales and also mapping the depth to constraints and so I think in, in that context as well, it's really nice where we see these sort of partnerships where we have the likes of, you know, the University of Sydney and then PCT, you know, as a market leader in precision ag analytics as well, partnering in that process with other growers and then subcontractors, it really gives us a lot of confidence as well that we can see that pull through to products on farm that really help move forward in terms of, you know, applications of precision ag. <clears throat> We've got another new project that recently just got kicked off around operations optimization on farm. So logistics being a key bottleneck. I can see Bindi in the crowd there and Bindi's heavily involved with that. And um, there'll be another announcement sort of coming out around that in a broader portfolio soon, but that's with a company called Verge Technologies, who we're really excited about how they're thinking about that space and the traction they've got to date. Um, but also when we're thinking about precision ag and what's coming through the pipeline, We've got a lot of other key investments as well around things like crop phenology and abiotic stress, which to some extent, you know, probably sit in this part of the community in crop physiology and crop agronomy, but we can just looking forward thinking there's great applications to bring in some of those layers around crop phenology and spatial mapping of the historical frequency and severity of frost and heat risk and how they plan into pre-season decisions and then tactical responses. There's just, there's a lot of things bubbling away, like projects that we intend to have discrete value in their own right but also uh, kind of act as building blocks into something that can be pulled together down the track to create additive benefits for growers. And the last piece that I just want to talk to um, is another portfolio that we've just recently established and we'll have an announcement coming out soon around what that looks like and sort of who's in the tent and what the focus areas are, is around, so just, you know, quote unquote, next-gen technologies for site-specific weed and disease management. <clears throat> and so that's a portfolio that's looking around sort of 20 to 25 to $30 million of investment from GRDC matched against or with co-investment from other partners. And we've got major corporates, again, SMEs, startups, universities, research organisations involved in that mix with a really strong focus on site-specific man weed management. And so I'll talk a bit later on. Uh, if you want to chat about morning tea or later on around sort of the, the way we're thinking about that space in particular, but we're pretty excited to see that portfolio hit the ground running. And a lot of those projects are already contracted. There's just one more to get there. Um, but yeah, we'll have more more details coming out soon just around who's involved and, and what's going on there. So I think that's it for me. Um, I guess maybe just a final thought is, you know, in the various conversations talking about precision ag and what we have coming through, um, there's a pretty big uplift, as you'd see, sort of see from GRDC and the RDE plan, the types of investments I've talked through. Um, 
but the main thing I think is looking forward, we're not so much limited, I think, in a grains perspective in terms of what we could do from a technical standpoint or on the research side between GRDC and our partners. It's really just having that value in that value chain in place to ensure that we're not just focusing, I guess, on you know the, the leading growers, a lot of which are represented here in this room. But how do we make sure we're not in a position in five or ten years, for instance, where we have a lot of products coming through the pipeline, innovations and partnerships, which it's only really a small set of growers who can benefit from because there's a broader mass of growers who just really aren't in that position to actually start to benefit from those sort of innovations. And so that's the, I guess, a key thing that you know keeps me up at night when thinking about planning through the portfolio is how do we increase that or create a broader adoption ready market for the next kind of layer of precision ag technologies coming through. And that's not an easy question to solve, right? But you know, we've got things in the pipeline to help address that. But again, um, if people have their thoughts or perspectives that they want to share with GRDC in the context of trying to address those challenges, please come and find me because we're really happy to chat. Uh, thank you. That's it for me. Thanks. And we've probably got time for, for, for one question. Yeah, just yeah. on that last point, I heard a really good comment from Bill Hughes and said, I'd like Daryl last week to say, and was asked about the burgers. You did a focus group and said, we would, you know, would you eat this product? You'd probably get eight or seven, nine percent say yes. Well, when they actually look in through the hundred jacks that come to order from the menu, then the reality of that is much lower. And that I actually thought about, well, if I'm a smart machine, but if you sat around the focus groups, went to that huge percentage of the observer, I guess, would love to see it. Then the question is who's actually going to go into the dealer and go, I'll oh, buy oh, 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 it So the actual mm. extension. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And I think just to add to your point, Colin, as well, like um technical support from dealerships and others, you know, like is that really going to be in place? And there's different levers that I think that the OEMs have, but it's all part of the puzzle. Like it's it's quite complex, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Lane. And to, uh, to, to wrap up the, the, this morning's session, we've just got a, uh, some industry news from Case IH, who couldn't be here this morning, but have got a, uh, a short video to play. On the test of time, there is no cheating. We know because we've taken that test for 180 years. We started in the shed with a thick coat of red. Even way back, we decided to move forward because playing catch-up isn't our game. So we dug our heels into traction, and next we overhauled harvesting. Then we really joined in with application accuracy. After that, we found a way to get machines to talk. We've been here, from horse to horsepower, from the small and mighty to the monstrous and the autonomous, from fierce continents to frozen ones, and we plan on staying, lending a hand here, a shoulder there, or an ear here. We'll be here for our farmers. and here to keep Australia moving forward is what we do. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. That sort of wraps up the this morning session so we can uh, head next door for morning tea and the trade display. On the test of time. And if we can be, uh, be back in at, I think it's... Uh, uh, 10, 10 past to our kickoff next session. Thank you. Um, sorry, um, um,
All right, music's winding down, discotheca's over. Hello, Patrick at the back. Patrick, Shh. Sit, sit down, never listens to me, all right? Um, all right, so I'm Tom Bishop, University of Sydney. I'm the chair. I'm going to close this out for everyone, this, this symposium. Um, so first up, we have Roger, works for Cyro. Um, what can I say? He's a modeler. Um, I call him the high priest of AppSim. So welcome, Roger, to the stage. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. And thank you, everybody, for the invitation to speak here today. And uh, today I'd like to talk about a little project that we went, ran with the Levy Grower Group and with the Stirlings to Coast Grower Group um, on a suite of ag tech that we deployed into farms all over the state, both in the low rainfall zone and the high rainfall zone. Purpose of the project, oh, here, this will be useful, um, was to look at... What does technology adoption on farm really look like? We've all been playing with precision ag technology for, for many years. Um, I think I made my first yield map in 1997 um, and have been developing analytics off it. So how far have we come in that time? And then how do we assess adoption? How, does, how do yield maps, for example, compare to other types of technology? Now, to do this... We need to think through, well, how do we rank the technology? What, is it, what does technology adoption actually mean? Well, there's something called an, a technology adoption framework. Now, it's something that's used by people who will look at adoption of technology, and it has four key categories. The first one is something called perceived usefulness. The, the nice way of thinking about that is, does it seem like a good idea? If I put a yield map in front of you, most people would think, oh, yeah, it's not a bad idea to have a look at a yield map. That's an example of this perception, this sort of innate curiosity and perception that a yield map could be a useful thing. The next one is, well, how easy is it to use it? If you just put a yield map in front of someone, that's fine, but how hard is it to get to that point that you must create that yield map for that paddock? How much effort do you have to go to get it from the header into in front of you? Not only that, it might be, well, how much effort do I now have to go to to compare that to last year's yield map? How much effort do I have to go to to look at the yield map in the paddock next door or consider my entire farm and how I might create this piece of technology that I can make a decision with. So that's all about the perceived ease of use. In other words, you might go, the yield map's really useful, but it's too hard to do. So that would mean that technology has stopped or the adoption process has stopped at the ease of use level of the adoption framework. The next one might be that you go, you know what, I've got a header that can handle this, I've got software that can handle and create yield maps for me, or I have a consultant to do it for me. Do I actually go through and do it? I might have thought it's a great idea, but I got busy, I needed a holiday after the harvest, 
I then needed to clean out the harvesters. Lo and behold, I needed to order my seed and fertilizer for the following year. And I got too busy. And guess where the yield maps are? They're still sitting in the software and I never actually used them to make a decision in the following year. It didn't change my fertilizer strategy. It didn't change my crop sowing strategy. I didn't ameliorate a paddock as a result of them. They're just sitting there and you get halfway through the next season and you haven't even looked at last year's yield maps. So that's where the intention to use the technology perhaps is, is where the adoption process fails. So, and then the final one is the behavior and actual use of the technology. So what that is, is do you fully implement this technology? Do you use it? Do you have a structure for using it? Do you go back and look at the yield maps? Do you then use them to make an informed planting decision, an informed nutrient decision? Do you incorporate them into on-farm experimentation? Do you use them right the way through to the complete capabilities of the technology? Once you reach that level, that's what we call full adoption of the technology. You know why you're buying it. You know that you've used it. You then use it and you do something with it. So what we did was we used this framework to then go about looking at different types of technologies. So one of the first ones that we looked at was a soil water sensor. We plugged soil water sensors into growers' paddocks all over the state, courtesy of the grower groups, and then supported that. That information was passed back to apps and the growers were able to look at it uh, and look at graphs such as this, giving you an insight into the soil water status at a point. We also represented that data as plant available water. So we could look at concepts such as how big is the bucket? How much water can my soil hold? and where am I at? So you can communicate that back. And again, that was provided through software platforms that the growers had access to. The next piece of data that we had, we had either local weather stations, which were part of the Deep Herds network, or we had access to the Bureau of Mets weather stations, but we also installed on-farm Met stations as well. These were all communicating daily weather data back to through, via apps to growers so they could just look at it on their phone. And what we were doing with things like temperature as well as rainfall was giving them some sort of information. And here it's Delta T. So it's used to assist with logistics and planning and sowing uh, uh, and spraying operations. So you get an idea of, okay, can I get away with spraying or not? Uh, have conditions deteriorated to such a point that I can't do it. So that was another piece of technology that we were able to demonstrate to them and get some understanding of how that growers reacted to it. The third one was uh, yield maps, as you would all expect, uh, much of this conference. This is just straight out of the John Deere system and we overlaid it onto to Google Earth just for something to do and provided that to the growers and they were all very comfortable uh, with that technology, they'd all seen it. It wasn't new to anybody. And then we provided uh, additional insights with satellite imagery. So we were providing uh, remote sensing through most of your conventional packages, such as Google Earth Engine or something along those lines, to allow them to look at both an NDVI. So we processed that was a request. They said, can you do NDVI? We said, yes, okay, we'll give you an NDVI and we were able to process that for a particular paddock and allow them to look at it and use it. And then we also would prepare a nice little time series for them to show them and present it as a GIF as this, and this is just Sentinel-2, where we could allow them to look at how that evolves over time if they so wished. We then followed that up with giving a little bit more detail on NDVI and saying, look, we actually created a harmonized NDVI. So those of you in the room would be familiar that there's more than 
one satellite that's available. So this is a blend of Landsat, MODIS and Sentinel-2 to create a continual uh, NDVI stream through time just to allow you to compare one season with the next. Again, another use of satellite technology allowing you to compare multiple seasons. Uh, as Tom alluded to, uh, I do do something with APSOM from time to time. So we also went in, used the soil water data to calibrate the APSOM model for that specific paddock and then used it to generate yield profit output, which is looking at yield potential and then also the nitrogen balance of the paddock to assist with a nitrogen recommendation based on what that might be. This information was actually provided to them through the yield profit uh, mechanism. We didn't provide them with customized APSOM output. That was deliberate because we wanted them to, to, to get an idea of how they reacted to the industry systems and platforms that are currently available to every grower. So this is, this is actually one of the last slides of the talk but I'll walk you through it. So when we looked at each of these technologies, I'll start with guidance on the, the left-hand side. It was used by every single grower that we, we interviewed. They, were, they understood why they were using it. They were comfortable using it. They had consultants to assist them with it. Yes, they had the occasional teething problems. There were grumbles about run lines and getting them to work. But what they would do is they would run work through those issues and then basically solve them and use them and use them year in, year out, use them on every paddock. And it was what we would call complete adoption. The next technology that we had was all of the weather apps. It didn't matter whether it was the local weather station, whether it was the Bureau of Mets weather station, whether it was the Deep Herd weather station, Growers were variable in terms of how which particular one they used, but they all used them. They were all very interested in them. They were looking at their apps constantly. They really liked the apps in terms of how they could interact with it. And what they were doing was using it for logistics planning. They could see the use. They knew why. They were looking at the weather data uh, they knew how to interpret it. They knew what to decision to make from it. They would make that decision and then they would proceed and act on that piece of information. They were the two most widely adopted pieces of technology, highly successful, high penetration into a large number of growers. Then we move to soil moisture. Now, this was interesting. We put these soil moisture sensors into the field. So we were actively monitoring them. We were supporting them. We were providing all of the diagnostics and assistance that you could need to make them work. So they did actually work. That's, you know, that was the first challenge. Um, and there was a lot of enthusiasm and that's this perceived use bar. Um, this, this bar here. So you can see there was a lot of enthusiasm. People wanted the soil moisture information. But then things deteriorated a little bit in terms of the adoption. And we said, okay, you've got a soil moisture probe there and it's giving you an indication of your plant available water holding capacity. What do you do with it? And that's when we got stunned silence in terms of how to interpret it, what decision do I make with it? Because once the crop's in the ground, uh, it can help you with a nitrogen decision. But if the nitrogen decision is being made sort of anyway, its value proposition to the grower is not as great as we might intrinsically or intuitively think. So therefore, that's where the perceived ease of use was also a bit of an issue where they, they, they saw it as a difficult thing to interpret. They saw it as the intention and the decision that they made from it was harder to, to reconcile. And this led to a slightly a much lower behavior and response to it. 
there were also questions around, well, how representative of that is the re is it to the rest of the paddock or the rest of the farm? How many of these do I need across the landscape to use them effectively? So they were still questioning the value of the technology. And then we moved into crop monitoring. So I did show you all of the uses and the different ways of displaying NDVI and we, we, we stuck to the optical technologies. For those of you who are in the room who are familiar with things like SAR platforms, we stayed away from that because they're actually a little bit more abstract again. But even when we provided that technology, what happened was, again, a lot of people thought it would be useful when it came to putting the map in front of them. It was like, well, what do I do with that? What do I do with an NDVI value of 0.7? How do I turn this into an action? How do I change my management? And this meant when, with conversations, people started talking about weeds. They ta started talking about the equivalent of a harvest index where you might compare your yield map to, your, to the uh, NDVI signature that you're getting across the field. But they, even when they did that, we then said, well, what decision do you make once you've got that information? And the general response was, I don't know. So... There's this real problem with satellite imagery at this point that it's not intrinsically linked to a key decision-making process. And therefore that leads to both a lack of intent in terms of the intention to use it and persevere and continue with it. And it also means that the behavior and the decision that you make from it is not that high either. And then finally, as someone who works in simulation, and crop modeling, it was actually the lowest <laughs> interpreted and understanded uh, piece of technology that we had in terms of people, when we put up the yield, the uh, PDFs of yield, uh, probability density functions of yield and the decisions that they would make, it was a little bit unclear what next to do with a yield profit thing, even related to a nitrogen decision, because Probability density functions to scientists might be second nature, but really the way that information and that insight was communicated could do with a bit of work. Oops. So in summary, weather and guidance, they're highly, uh, they're widely adopted and accepted. We'd say that the acceptance is very high. They are used. But both crop monitoring with satellites and yield monitors, they trailed those two technologies, even though they were widely tried. So what a lot of, like if you surveyed a farm and asked the question, have you used a yield map? Have you used an NDVI map? And there is a lot of literature where that's said, and, the, and the, the, the number there is very high, but then it doesn't translate into long-term change in farming practice. Simulation modeling was also widely trialed. But again, the technology acceptance is low. So we need, if we're looking at a greater adoption of these two technologies, they're further down or lower in scale on the technology adoption matrix. They need more investment to make them intuitive, make them easy to use so that they link to a clear decision. So that was the key findings of uh, this little project that we ran with uh, Libby and Sterlings to Coast. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Are there any questions out in the wild? Patrick. I think I agree with you there. You know, there's been a lot of research on creating new technologies because you know, there's lots of work focused on that. But I think your results really show that we need some investment in translation and extension because you know, as researchers, we're constantly thinking about the next big thing. But you know, we've got technologies that are very useful, but we just need to translate that so growers can actually use it and make a genuine difference. Thank you. I think that was a comment. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Patrick, that wasn't a question. So we'll try again. Thank you. Charlie, we're just going to go take it. Um, I'm just interested, Roger, whether the framework that you outlined applies equally to uh, other types of technology. If I'm not mistaken, a lot of what about data-driven technology and the support decision-making. What about um, processing <laughs> hardware technology and, and, and the cost 
thereof. Would that framework still hold true? It ought to. It's a generic technology adoption framework. It was not one designed for agriculture. It's actually used, doesn't matter if you're talking about the adoption of the iPhone. Um, it's been deployed to any technology you can imagine in any industry that you can you care to, to define. So I think your technology, you know, that you're thinking through or thinking about, you could apply it equally to this to find out what the barriers to adoption were. It's designed to help develop technology to a point that it actually has an impact and to find where you are in that path to then invest more to encourage the, and, and generate that impact. That's the purpose of it. And the commercial sort of technology would fit what is the intention to use? What is it? I think it, it just it would depend on the technology. There is a process that you go through to discover where the particular technology you have sits in that, that framework. Yes, sure. Let's do one more. Yeah. Oh, look, in all honesty, not really. Um, <laughs> it's it's not the easiest thing in the world to use. And it was it was always trained as a research tool. And look, a couple of years ago, we built an app that delivered uh, simulation data to people instantly, and that was very successful. Um, if we could bring back something that was easy to use as that, um, I think we might we might do better. It's really you need to push too many buttons to use it well and have confidence in it, and we know that. So, all right. Let's thank Roger. Thank you for that, Roger. All right. So now we have Sarita Bennett, who is discipline lead in agriculture and food at Curtin University. We have a nice change of pace because I think we're talking about education in precision ag. So welcome, Sarita. Where's the point? There? Thank you very much. I feel like I should have been at the start of the, the talk with the education of what we're trying to do the students, and then you can all say how you've taken it from there. But going backwards, what I'm going to do today is to give you sort of a journey that we take this agri-business and agricultural science students through um, at Curtin University to ensure that hopefully when they graduate, they're able to take some of these precision agriculture technologies either back to the farm or they can use them in their jobs as agronomists or um, working for Deep Herd or, or wherever so that we can start to see the adoption, um, familiarity and, and sort of comfort in using these technologies um, a bit more and increase that uptake. Um, so we've we've all seen over the last day and a half precision agriculture and associated technologies are becoming critical components of farming systems. Um, they're widely available, and yet there's there's still sort of very mixed response about farmers using them. Um, it's therefore essential that the graduates today are equipped with a knowledge of these technologies, how to implement them, but also really importantly, how to interpret them. And that's one of the things we really focus on that it's it's relatively easy to teach a student how to draw a map, but how to actually interpret what it means and to put it together is a really important part of that journey. Um, it's important for us to recognise that the technologies are currently changing and improving, and therefore we need to make sure that students have the ability to um, upskill themselves when they graduate and when they enter the industry. It's no good us assuming that what we teach them today is what they're going to be using for the next 10 to 15 you know, years off of their career, because that's completely um, untrue. It's changing so fast that we need to make sure that they have both the desire and the ability to upskill themselves. And therefore, the aim of this talk is to take you through that journey that we take our students through. Um, so it's a three-year journey. We Rather than leaving teaching them precision agriculture to the end, we try and start some of those, those skills right from year one. Um, and to ensure that the digital technologies are taught alongside their core skills um, and embedded within the units from first year onwards. So in first year, some of the units that they have that are applicable, they do an introduction to computer programming to start them getting familiarity with some of that um, sort of technology. 
They have a geographic information science and remote sensing unit, um, which uses ArcGIS. And then they also have another unit, which is an introduction to soil science, where they get to map some of their water samples and soil samples. And in that program, I mean, that unit, they use QGIS. So they're, they're instantly being introduced to two separate units, um, um, two separate packages. And there's a conscious decision with that not to get them very familiar with one package, but, but to be able to operate across a number of different ones because there's lots of other packages out there as well. And so depending where they end up working, um, depending on their farm machinery, they'll be using different packages. And so it's making them comfortable with learning new packages with thinking, oh, well, that bit's similar to this. So if I, you know, if I do this, then that's going to work. Um, second year is a bit more of a focus on the core skills, but they do have, have another unit on soil test interpretation, um, actually making use of the maps and understanding what it means, being able to give the advice back to growers in what they can then um, do with that information, plus another unit on quantitative skills. Then in third year, um, we really start to engage with industry to get students applying the knowledge that they've gained and starting to use real world case studies from both cropping and pasture systems. Um, and we've really got to focus on some of the free software. So QGIS, R, satellite imagery, and then the interpretation of maps. And there's been a conscious decision to do that because one, um, depending wherever they go out into the industry, it's something that's still available for them, but also the network of people using those software is huge. And so if they've got a question that goes beyond what they know, they can ask somebody on the internet and somebody comes back with an answer. And so there's a real network community of using those programs that will enable themselves to continually upskill themselves if that's what they want to do. And so what I'm gonna do now is take you through one case study example that we teach um, in our advanced cropping systems unit and how we sort of build the skills of the students in both learning how to draw the different maps, but also then the interpretation and bringing in lots of other different data that's freely available that they can use to help them in that interpretation. So um, this is using data from um, Bob Nixon's farm, so up at Kalani. So thank you very much, Bob, for letting me use the data and present it here. Um, and it's, he gives us each year three years of data from a paddock. It's not necessarily the same paddock from year to year to ensure that students can't copy data from a previous student. Um, and it's got yield data and both protein data. And he purposely picks a paddock that has issues. So he's not picking a paddock that highlights the best yields he's got off the farm. That's a nice even map that shows how well his soil amelioration or his pH management or whatever he's done is perfect. He's very much highlighting an issue. So I've shown you here this year, it was last year's um, paddock with canola. Um, and you can see straight away that there's issues in the paddock in terms of um, both variability of yield but also in terms of the data. And so that leads then to some discussions with the students of why there are lines across a paddock. And those issues with when a farmer's using two different headers on a paddock, but they haven't actually been calibrated before he starts. And so he ends up with these lines across a paddock where it's picking up different yields, depending which header happened to run along that line. Um, and are the very high and very true levels low? So at the moment, this map I'm showing you has had no data removed from it at all. It's taken completely off the header. There's been no justification of what's there. So are there areas like your headlands where it's been harvested more than once? Are there areas where a line's got blocked and then it's cleared and so you get a much higher um, reading for you know, an, an, a, a particular distance because the distance before had nothing? Um, and then the other discussion we have with the students is how many classes is actually practical for a grower? And a lot of programs will give you seven to 10 different classes, makes the map from a scientist perspective easy to interpret. But for a, a grower who's actually going to use that to maybe determine what his fertilizer impacts are going to be the following year, it's too much to deal with. And so you have that discussion about what is the number of classes a grower will actually deal with. And for them then going and working in the industry, they would need to have that discussion with each individual grower. And one, some, one may be happy with four, even though they're only going to use two because it helps them in their interpretation. Others want two or want three and they don't want to deal with anything more. So the students then go on and actually get rid of those 
sort of the tails off the distribution that are the data that's probably not true, bring down the classes to something that they can interpret to a grower um, and they would have to also go back with, to that to the grower and talk about calibrating their harvesters before they start so that they don't end up with the lines across the paddock from different readings. And so then you can move on to the next set of questions. How would they deal with these high yielding areas and the low yielding areas? Um, you can see on this one, and I'm frightened I'm going to finish the whole presentation here. Yes, I've got it right. You know, you've got some very low yielding areas here and you've got some higher yield, low uh, um, yielding areas in the bottom part of the paddock. How would they manage them? Is it occurring in all seasons? So is one year's data enough? Do they need to start looking at more year's data? Um, what are the reasons for the high and low yields? What other information do they need that will help them interpret that? Um, what other information can they add to the map? Um, and would the map look different with different seasons? And if that's in the same crop or probably with a different crop as well. So you'll have a different season with a different crop. So how are you going to interpret those difference? What happens if we add a pasture, if this was a mixed cropping farm? How do you deal with that pasture data? And a lot of people, the pasture data is too hard and they'll map all their cropping years and the pasture just happens and we won't deal with that one. Um, so they then go on and they've got a second year's data. So here's a, the same paddock, wheat 2021. And you can see that the results from the wheat were completely different to the canola. So that's related to what's happened in the season, as well as those two different crops response to the soil constraints um, in that paddock as well. About probably the only thing that overlaps in that is this poor area around here. And then you've got a, a, a better yielding area here. So the students then start to look at some of that other data that they can bring in to interpret that. So we've got the soil data. They can look at both the Google Maps image, gives you a bit of indication of what it looks like. There's some soil test data there, um, which they had available to use, which gave them information on nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, surface pH, subsurface pH. And they can start to interpret all of that, have a look at what it was, was um, there. Those soil test data were taken in 2020, so um, they and they were done pre any yield mapping. So were they taken in the best place? If you were to go back to a grower and suggest you did more yield um, soil test data, where would you put those points? They wouldn't necessarily be in the same places. And you can see that there's some areas that are almost missed that look quite different on the, that Google map image. Um, the other thing they can look at is the elevation data. And you can see that you've got areas of the paddock that are um, higher from a West Australian point of view. Oh, this still amazes me, having been in Australia for so long, that 320 to 345, other way around, that's the 345 to 320, is a slope coming from, from North Wales, where that is not a slope. That's about as flat as you'd ever dream of. Um, <laughs> but that's a slope, and you're getting different responses as a, as a response to that. The other thing they can look at is the weather data um, through the season. So you can have a look to see what the, the annual rainfall was, the growing season rainfall. Um, other things they can look at, when was the break of season? So was it a short season, which has given you limited yields for that year? Um, have you had particularly high rainfall events? And so if there's any um, water logging issues, then that may occur in some areas. What was the season length? And the other thing that's important for them to always go back at is look at whether any frost events, and so in those low-lying parts of the paddock, will the crop get frosted? Um, and that is what happens in, in this paddock in the for the wheat um, yield. Um, and maximum temperatures in spring, terminal drought. So it's making them really start to think about, you can't just look at a yield map. You have to look at everything else that goes around it to be able to interpret it. And there's parts of a paddock that in a... Um, in a drought year will grow do the best yields because they're not waterlogged but in a wet year the yields will be terrible because it's waterlogged so they have to understand the season the soil types as well as the you know what the yield map is actually giving them and so that final bit then is to actually put it all together so they've got three years of harvest um, two were wheat and one canola in this year's example they've got the protein data that goes with that as well um, they've got the Google Maps image they can use, 
the soil test points data, um, and they can also look at the, some of those correlations between the soil test point data rather than producing maps of every single one. Are some of those highly correlated? And so something like the pH may be correlated to the phosphorus availability, and so they don't need to produce two separate maps for that. And then interpreting the weather data that goes with that. And as the final sort of part of that, they have to write that up as a consultancy report, as if they were the agronomist giving the information back to a grower. So they have to write it in that format that a grower can interpret the results and can then come back to the agronomist with the next set of questions or, you know, wanting the information about how they can then implement variable rate fertiliser um, map for the next season. The other thing we do with the students is to then add in NDVI maps for the season as well. This is obviously a different paddock. Um, and there's been a couple of people this morning talk about NDVI maps not being particularly useful because they don't tell you actually what the issues is. They tell you the high and the low years. Um, but they do tell you what's happening through the season. So even if you download them three times through the season, they do tell you what's happening before you get that yield map. So they are an additional resource that's available. Um, and in this example here, they're giving us information from two pasture years as well as a cropping year. So they're enabling on a mixed farm to give you information about how that paddock's performing across continuous years rather than just relying on the data from the cropping year. Um, and so this, this one here was an honour student that having taken his first three years journey learning about the precision agriculture technologies decided that he liked it, but he came from a mixed farm. And so he wanted to find a way of actually adding in the pasture years as well as his cropping years. And so NDVI was really important to him. And he went back to the farm, did some biomass ground truthing, and then we were able to get some further interpretation from those NDVI maps. And then having following Roger's talk, we also get the students to do some APSIM as well. <laughs> um, Third year students only get a little introduction to it. So it's just a taster to show them it's there. But we also run a master's program in agricultural systems and they spend quite a significant proportion of a unit learning APSIM. So that, that becomes a technology that they can take to use for their research projects and build in with some of this precision agriculture technologies. So in conclusion, precision agriculture and associated technologies are key skills um, required for agricultural graduates of today. It's important for graduates not to be able to only use these technologies, but also to interpret them um, and interpret the maps and then to provide clear management plans for either their own or for their client's farm. And that's something I really stress to the students that we're not training them to be producing maps, full stop. The interpretation is part of that skill that they need to sell when they're going for their jobs as well. Um, industry engagement is an essential component of their learning and the use of the case studies. And thanks to all the farmers that so willingly always give me data whenever I ask for it. Um, and then finally, just the importance of the ability to upskill students through their future career pathway. So thank you. So thanks to Bob Nixon for his data and then to Kurt and staff um, also involved in this journey as well. Richard Harris, Todd Robinson and Beck Swift. Thank you. Questions? Oh, I'll ask one. Okay, so my question um, is, you have all this content you put in, what content did you lose? So what's the quantity of learning effort here? So was there discussions about, you know, the content that was lost to fit it all in? Um, interesting question. Oh, because, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we have that at us. The, the elders always want to keep the classics in. And, yeah. yeah. I think we tried to structure the degree. So a lot of that classic learning around like the agronomy side of things get covered in second year. And then the third year has always been very much focused about the application of the agronomy. So I'm hoping that we haven't lost anything really important, but we're actually providing the students with extra skills. Oops. Yeah. Can I ask you, it's just, do you, do you get bots talking? Yes, we get we get Bob. To, we actually take the students on our field tour. We actually spend a day out at Bob's farm, so they go to then see the paddock that they've mapped. They get to walk around it, see what some of the issues are, um, but also just to see his operation and how he's managing everything else. Yeah, he's really involved. It's really nice. Oh, 
Do you get any feedback on where the students ended up? Um, well, Bradley's one of our students. <laughs> um, post probably, yeah, I haven't done, some of them go back on farm. There's probably about a third go back on farm. Um, the majority would go into agronomy positions. It's not necessarily where they end up. Um, a lot of them go into agronomy positions for three to five years and then head back on farm. Um, Deep Herd picks up quite a few. Um, yeah, most of them stay regional. Not many stay in the city. So, yeah. Any more questions? Oh. Very related question. I think that percentage wise, how much of those students are off the farm? Um, about two thirds are off farm. Of the remaining third, probably about half of those are regional from and have parents that are involved in the agricultural industries, but not necessarily off farm. And then the the remainder of, were from the city, but the ninety nine percent of those would have a link to a farm somehow. There's very few students that come in with having had absolutely no exposure to agriculture before they come in much as we go around all the schools and try and sell agriculture, you seem to need to have that background that encourages you to come. Yeah. One more. I don't know. We haven't got it right yet. <laughs> yeah. I would love to find out a way of getting students in the city who have no exposure to agriculture to get involved. And I think it it relies a lot of it on schools. I've been proactively sending stuff to different schools to the careers teacher. Yeah. And my son's currently year 11 and I'll say to him, did, that inf did you get that information? And the careers teachers aren't passing it on. So they don't perceive it to be a valid career, unfortunately. They're still pushing the big, big ones, yeah. Mm. Yes, it's a hard one when students then don't have the right skills and then, you know, year 12 suddenly have an epiphany they want to go to agriculture. Yeah. Sorry, just Brett's still getting angry, so I've got I to turn, turn it off. Yeah, sorry. So thank you, Sarita. Um, that talk was great. Thank you. All right, so next up we have James Turtle, who works for Magrotech and... He's Southern Business Development Manager for Magrotech. Welcome. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Tom. Uh, morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity from both SPA and the University of Sydney, for the opportunity to come and speak to you today about Magrotech. So Magrotech is a magnetic assisted spray technology, um, which we kind of like the, the, the statement, making more of less. Um, so I'm going to take you through, I guess, essentially what the technology is first and foremost, um, but then share with you some crop science trial results um, that we've generated over the last couple of seasons in Australia. So growers today are increasingly required to be more efficient, more productive, more profitable and more sustainable whilst balancing the demands of ever-changing input labour and environmental costs. I guess the question is why compromise your ability to manage productivity, profitability, and sustainability? Growers are faced with issues that range from drift, wastage, water usage, labour shortages, and if recent history tells us anything, considerable cost and inflationary pressures. Effective spraying practices can contribute to productivity, efficiency, efficacy and sustainability, and should aim to influence our profitability by way of improved agronomic outcomes. So how does Magrotech help to solve some of these major spraying issues? We've got a powerful solution, is the long and the short of it. And we want growers to benefit in, in those solutions. So benefits such as increased coverage, reduced drift, reduced water and chemical usage, improved efficacy, and superior canopy penetration, all aim to better the bottom line. Magrotech works across all brands of sprayer, 
It works on all crops. There are no moving parts or maintenance, and it is easy to install and use. So how does Magrotech work? So Magrotech is grounded in the proven science of what's called magnetic treatment of fluids. It delivers it in a pretty simple and effective format though. While the science to get there is complex, the technology itself is really easy to install and even easier to use. Fluid passes through a series of uh, manifolds containing permanent magnets, along with magnetic rods inserted in the boom line itself, uh, which change the physical characteristics of the spray droplet. The magnetic treatment of these droplets results in a much greater percentage of the right size droplet. These stick more effectively, reduce waste, and give better coverage. To understand what Magrotech delivers first, we kind of need to understand what is fundamentally happening when we use a sprayer nozzle. Droplets come essentially in three formats out of a nozzle, fine, medium, and coarse. And yes, there are a greater range than that, but categorically, that's sort of where, where we're aiming at. Most nozzles on a nozzle chart will emit a percentage of all of those. And, and generally, it's about a third of each. So there's a conception out there that we've got a coarse nozzle that's putting out coarse droplets. It, it's actually putting out a, a component of, of finer than that and, and coarser than that across the spectrum. So the fitment of Magrotech to a spray results in the generation of more of the right size droplets or optimal size droplets, which improve coverage, reduce drift, improve chemical efficacy and reduce waste. So some visual proof. This image shows considerably increased levels of spray coverage. Sorry, wrong one. I'll go back a page. During a recent study, so these dryland cotton in southern Queensland, uh, a UV nighttime study was undertaken um, with Magrotech fitted to one sprayer and another sprayer running a conventional spray system. This image shows the coverage of the conventional machine at 100% rate. The feedback from the agronomist on site, the boom operator, the farm manager, at the time felt that that was actually quite an adequate spray job. Then we showed the Magrotech option. So we've got considerably increased level of spray coverage. And this is actually the treatment that saw us using a 20% less water rate. So we've got superior coverage to a conventional sprayer using 20% less water. So what's that really mean in the, the long and the short of it? A perfect example was that we used it in a, a defoliation trial in dryland cotton. So we saw a more effective and rapid progression of leaf drop as a result of more coverage and better canopy penetration. So the image on your left-hand side, um, that one there, you can see quite a, a substantial number of green leaves still on the, the plant itself, um, as opposed to the image on the right-hand side, where we've seen basically complete defoliation. Um, I guess the key to this was what we ultimately ended up seeing was that the Magrotech treated plot was harvested three days sooner with a lot less trash in the sample at the end of the day. But I think the key for us is we're not just asking people to take Magrotech's word for it. So Magrotech used some independent third-party validation to, I guess, demonstrate that the patented system does in fact deliver more of the desired droplets onto the target than what a conventional machine does. Magrotech delivers a powerful financial impact for farmers with paybacks often of less than a year. It delivers this impact through at least 20% better coverage, up to 70% less drift, therefore less waste, and a reduction in inputs of at least 20%. It also allows for efficiency and productivity gains, whereby we can cover up to twice as many acres or hectares every day with reduced application rates 
and with the capacity to spray and wind speeds up to 25 kilometres an hour. With Magritech, there are real and immediate financial benefits, and I want to give you an example of that. So using our return on investment calculator and utilising a Magrotech system, a farm of 4,000 hectares, spending $770,000 a year on ag chem, which equates to $193 a hectare, can see a return on investment in 18 months by reducing their water and chemical rate by just 2%. Considering the results we've achieved in trials to date, suggesting that reducing rates by 20% is realistic, return on investment can obviously be much sooner than that. Not only does Magrotech deliver financially, but it does deliver for the environment as well. All sustainable product environmental initiatives are rooted in productivity. Our system helps farmers to be more profitable by, buying, by being more sustainable. Magrotech enables growers to reduce their volume of chemicals and water used by at least 20% whilst maintaining profitable agronomic outcomes. Magrotech's patented technology largely solves the trade-off between productivity and sustainability. Magrotech's been effective in every environment that it's been tested in with every crop type that it's been tested on. Magrotech have sold in excess of 300 units worldwide into 16 countries, and there've been 110 crop science field studies completed in 26 different crops, from corn, canola, and cotton to soybeans, wheat, strawberries, and Brussels sprouts. In Australia, we've been fortunate to undertake a number of crop science projects to, to provide local validation. Uh, and I guess a key part for us has been local optimization of the results that we're seeing in agricultural and horticultural crops. I'd like to share what is essentially a really new hot off the press trial, which was some um, UV nighttime studies completed last month in Southern Queensland in dryland canola. It achieved some pretty remarkable results given some pretty testing uh, spray parameters given the nozzle being used. So what you'll see here is on these images is the conventional system on the left and the Magrotech system on the right. Um, Magrotech is about getting crop penetration and canopy penetration to get an effective kill of whatever it is we are chasing. Are we, are we trying to achieve a fungicide application? Are we trying to achieve an insecticide application? So pretty importantly for us is the, the observations we see from agronomists on site when we're undertaking these trials. The overall penetration with Magrotech was better. There was visibly better coverage with at least 15% better coverage of buds and flowers by the Magrotech system. There was a 70% hit rate for the Magrotech system versus 57% for the conventional sprayer. There were massive improvements in coverage of the shaded areas of the canopy with very few leaves having been missed. And there was far more spray on the target mid canopy and below. We also conducted a water sensitive paper trial. Same crop, same, crop, same property. Basically, Magrotech repeatedly achieved greater lower canopy penetration, even with reduced water rates when compared to the conventional treatment. These results were achieved in some pretty challenging conditions. When it's considered that speed, nozzle selection, and droplet spectrum are all firmly against the success of Magrotech, the system's results speak for themselves. Magrotech undertook, undertook some crop science work in defoliation of dryland cotton in 2022. When applying at the client's standard rate, and with their standard nozzle, a CFAU 11002 with extra coarse droplets, Magrotech increased total coverage by 73%. Following this, and as part of Magrotech's drive to, to really help growers optimise what they're doing and, and to gain the best possible agronomic outcomes, a second pass was completed using a turbo T-Jet TT110025 with a medium droplet, which resulted in an increase of a 187% in total coverage over the conventional system. The results found in Australia have been replicated across the world. This is a study in potatoes in northwest part of the United States, which found that Magrotech improved coverage in this instance by more than 100%, even at the reduced rate. Some of you may be familiar with a gentleman by the name of Andrew Kennedy. Andrew is one of Magro's early adopters in Australia and New Zealand, 
He's a contractor and farmer from Mount Gambier in South Australia, who's been using Magro Tech for nearly three years now and continues to be blown away by the results he's achieving for both himself and his clients. Andrew identifies four key areas as being key to the ongoing success of a Magro Tech system, such as the one fitted to his spray rig. Better coverage, reduced water usage, reduced drift, and increased efficiency and productivity. I'd like to play you a little testimonial video where Andrew talks about his experience with Magro Tech, um, and I'll take any questions after that. Industry for about 40 years. Uh, started here in Mangambia, where we are now on this operation. We are in the last South East of South Australia, probably one of the windiest places in the world. Our life means to us is 15 to 20 kilometres now. We've got pasture right through all the arable crop. We've got a lot of seed crop production spraying here. I've done a stint in uh, Northern Victoria on tomatoes. We spray a lot of touchy areas. We have houses, we have acceptable crops, we have livestock. So we have to be very careful when and where we spray. I think novel technology has nearly hit its maximum, if you like. And that's where something like Magro helps us get to the next stage. We fitted the Magro two years ago. We grabbed hold of it. We haven't looked back since we fitted it. The cost savings we're getting out of it every day, actually, is my life. With this system, we've probably extended our spray window by probably a day to eight and a half a week. It's given them better coverage. It's given them better penetration. Coverage and penetration are important. It doesn't matter whether you're spraying a small seed crop or a cotton crop or a wheat crop. It all needs coverage and penetration. And if you can do that and do it cheaply because you haven't got any bells and whistles, you've got the macro system. It's a no brainer. And it has certainly cut out water in right back, which means we've got more productivity if we both have down the line, which is a big thing on a lot of these properties that we have in the world. And we are getting drip reduction. And that's a big thing. We're having a lot of trouble in Australia with the spray drift. Last year, I took over being the chairman of the Australian Ground Growth Association. And we're just trying to get the word out there that there is a better way of doing it. There's not much. I've found I can't do. We've put it into some pretty extreme situations through the festivals. And we've come out the other side still smelling a rose. Well, we've done a video a couple of years ago with Jackson Billion. We just finished the coverage trial. We knew from the water sensitive paper that it looked pretty good. We had no idea how good. The numbers blew me away. It gave me more confidence to start playing with different models. We do a lot of insecticide work in the summertime with fungicide, and we found we were getting just as good a job with our love rate. And I grew a chickpea crop last year that got one fungicide for the whole thing. If you've only got to do one pass instead of three, you're in front of the game. And from a farmer, that's, that's dollars in the pot. And Magro should be on every spray rig that's running these new technologies. I think there's a little bit more to be unpacked out of it yet. The next lab could be quite interesting. Uh, but, uh, thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions? Um, sure, please go. Yeah, look, so there hasn't been any any standout work done or any any work done yet at this point um, into the overall effectiveness in, in herbicide applications, but certainly something that we're looking to do. Um, we see any opportunity to to assist and whether that's, and, and we've had some questions in the last couple of days around how does it work in conjunction with spot spraying systems and so on and so forth. Any spray system that is being used to execute whatever it may be is going to be um, amplified by the use of a system that improves coverage. So we'd certainly be keen to talk to anybody who, who's looking to do some collaborative work around um, herbicide usage for sure. Any more questions? 
All right, then um, we'll call in. Thank you, James, for that. That was interesting. Thank you. All right. So now we have Andrew Kuzomi from the University of Western Australia from the Center of Engineering, Innovation, Agriculture, and Ecological Restoration. We used to talk about weeds. We started with weeds, and we're going to end the conference, well, the formal part of talking on weeds. So thank you, Andrew. Enjoy. Thank you, um, and thank you for the opportunity to come here and speak today. Um, so I am going to talk about the evolution of targeted tillage for weed control in Australian global cropping um, from our University of Western Australia perspective. And so I'm going to talk about the journey over the last, um, it's probably about eight years now, um, from the weed chipper that some of you have probably heard about and to where we're going with those sorts of technology from fallow weed treatment into uh, in-crop treatment systems. So um, why are we sort of looking at this? It's always good to hear from people that aren't us. So um, some of you may recognize the voice and the person in here, Ray Harrington, an innovator in this space uh, from Western Australia, dark and just down south, a uh, person behind the Harrington Seed Destructor and various bits of technology also um, who got us involved into sort of this targeted tillage area as well. Understand this call of the shots. Do you know who manages all the farms now? The weeds. The weeds tell you the winter sow, the row spacing, the sowing rate. Everything I think about in farming now is all about the weeds. The weeds have got us all on the back foot. So um, obviously that's a, quite a um, strong remark uh, across um, ABC television that went uh, nationally. And so hearing it from a farmer about uh, how important weeds are to control is obviously a good piece of context to um, frame what it is that needs to be developed in this industry. So, so the challenge, um, so some of these slides might be a bit dated, but I'm trying to paint the picture of the uh, journey that we've been through. It's still obviously relevant. Herbicide resistance is a really big concern uh, for the industry. So what's going to happen um, as weeds become more and more resistant and we start to lose options for what farmers can use to treat their weeds. Obviously, there's a lot of pressure on glyphosate um, as well. And some years ago, uh, that became quite um, strong, actually just before sort of COVID hit, if you think back, there was actually a lot of stuff in the media and around the globe. And actually now there's some more stuff um, recently, I uh, was listening to some news articles yesterday about it. Obviously in Australia and particularly in Western Australia, and you'll see this, I think with your road trip tomorrow, um, conservation cropping is a really big part of what obviously happens in Australian cropping systems with minimum or zero till um, applications. And so those systems are highly productive and very profitable, but they are essentially reliant upon having herbicides available for that to happen. So there needs to be other technologies coming to fruition to help um, give farmers options to supplement their herbicide program so that they can keep going um, with providing food essentially for the global market and domestically because we all need to eat. Um, so around that, there's sort of security issues around farmer viability. What about the future of um, farming in Australia, farmer wellbeing? So there's all these other factors that come into play. So at the time, obviously, there was no other feasible broadacre non-chemical treatments for even fallow weed control. Um, we've moved, obviously, now into spot spraying applications, but they were actually quite novel at the time, moving away from blanket spraying. We've just had a talk looking at improvements in these sorts of areas. And so there was this idea around could we piggyback off some of these technologies that were facilitating spot spraying and come up with some approaches say for targeted tillage um, as opposed to triggering a solenoid nozzle and spraying something could you trigger um, a rapid response time to chip out a weed so that's essentially what we um, did and so the project was funded through the GRDC Grains Research Development Corporation um, it was a joint project, very multidisciplinary, uh, started off at the University of Western Australia, uh, led by Michael Walsh, who you heard from yesterday. Um, and I led the engineering at, on the project out of UWA. Um, Michael was then the weeds director at the University of Sydney. The project was quite successful. We were fortunate to be awarded WA Innovator of the Year in 2019. 
Um, and at the output of the project, we'd essentially developed a pre-commercial rig that was about six metres wide, not quite wide enough to show that it could work with tram lining, but gave the idea of how it could work in the field. And you sort of see some of this here. Um, and I think maybe some of you may have seen this video before, but this is the device in operation at uh, University of Sydney's uh, Lara property in Narrabri. And so that's travelling essentially at 10 k's an hour. It has a weeded camera on it. It spots um, green on brown. And instead of spraying a nozzle, it chips the weed out. Um, we had a bit too much ground engagement at the time. Um, that was on the fly, me calibrating it the morning of the film crew rocking up. Um, so then we went on to do more demonstrations, uh, led very much through uh, Michael's work over on the East Coast um, through New South Wales and Queensland. And here you see the device calibrated. Um, so it's actually behaving more like a chipper. And here's a very representative paddock, obviously very low weed densities, fellow condition about one weed per 10 square metres. And the device goes along and chips out the weeds when it spots it, just like a weed it um, enhanced boom would do. So how did we, um, well, the, the device was extremely effective. Um, we essentially achieved 100% kill rates um, from small conventional weeds like you would with a uh, spray nozzle up to really big weeds, like ones that we're talking about 80 centimetres in diameter. Um, obviously, a mechanical tool can produce a lot of force and hoeing um, is a very effective way of uh, removing plants from the soil. And so a mechanised version of that um, was always going to be quite successful. Um, and just the trial data that we received. And then we sort of went on to larger scale demonstrations. Like I said, it needed to be compatible with uh, minimal or no-till sort of applications. And so here is, again, property over in Narrabri before treatment, low weed densities. There are weeds there. You probably just can't see them. Um, and so just a bit of drone footage. And then after the treatment, so the weed chip has gone in, chipped out those weeds and essentially disturbed about 2% of the paddock area, which that's quite... Um, neat and obviously demonstrates its compatibility with sort of that requirement. How did this come about? So now we'll go back to actually understand this evolution and journey that we've been on. Um, and so the person on the left there is Ray Harrington. Um, and one of the people in the middle is Michael Widrick um, from QDAF. Um, but so the story goes and Michael was um, involved with this they were taking um, innovative farmers from Western Australia across the East Coast, Ray Harrington, um, the Messina brothers, Lance Turner, et cetera, and doing road trips, visiting various farms, hearing about their issues and listening to what farmers are talking about um, in those cropping regions. And they're recounting here essentially what they what happened at one of those farms. So as they were listening to a farmer talking about the issues they have on farm with herbicide resistance and some really big woody weed species just subconsciously the farmer was sort of backtracking walking around and as he was doing it was just kicking out weeds with his foot and so here they are saying when they hop back into the minibus why can't we mechanize a boot kicker and so they started talking and spruiking the word grdc got wind of it and uh, put up a tender call and we put in a tender application um, around our capabilities but also recognising that um, we needed industry support and farmer input. So we actually had an industry advisory panel comprising Ray Harrington um, and others. And so uh, we were successfully awarded the GRDC project and we had a very multidisciplinary team. Um, it was a three-year project, but we probably kept going for a, a bit just out of um, lots of interest and have still kept going. But um, so there was engineering at uh, UWA, um, Science was led by Michael Walsh University of Sydney and we had advisors from farmers, but also industry. We worked really closely with a um, hydraulics manufacturer in the southwest of Western Australia in Bunbury, so two hours south of um, Perth, uh, to help us realise the hydraulic actuation system that was required because the tractor's hydraulic output um, couldn't meet the demands of what was needed. Um, and so through the development process, we sort of, um, from an engineering point of view, we went through trying to develop the technology in sort of a technology readiness level framework of low 
sophistication a test module that was functional and then get more and more sophisticated as we debug that and get into more realistic environments and so um, initial trials were like with the device at UWA. We sent one to QDAF for trials. We sent one to Michael, which was trailer mounted for trials at Narrabri. And by the output of the project, we had developed a big rig. Um, so, sorry, I'm going backwards just because it's the way I do my talks. Um, so how did we actually do this? What we sort of came at was from a requirements point of view, low weed density. So one weed per 10 square meters. We need to think of the engineering requirements to develop this system. So if we sort of 10 square meters, we sort of said, what about a three by three, close enough, nine square meters. Say there's a weed appearing in any of those quadrats in a one square meter area. We then start to have some requirements. If we're going to do this with some sort of hoe chipping it out, we need to think that there could be a weed in one square meter and then it could need to go again in the next square meter. So it needs to be able to come in and out of the ground within about 0.3 of a second when you travel at about 10 Ks now. Um, it was a sort of a mandate of the project, one of, from all sorts of reasons, but one of the big ones was um, to also help farmers relate to what was being developed. It was decided early on to make it uh, based around a hydraulic breakout time. Um, and so the chosen module was a shearer trash worker. Uh, so that's what that schematic represents. And so a shearer trash worker has a single acting hydraulic breakout tine. Um, it can break out if it encounters something. But instead of us having the tine essentially 100% engaged in the soil, doing 100% tillage, we have it sitting in a standby position. We trigger it, it goes down and then comes back to standby. But the functionality is still maintained if it needs to break out. The challenge was around how do we do that? So on the left is the shear trash worker standard module. And what we came up with, I don't have the sweep showing here. You'll see it at the end. Um, was essentially a retrofit around that device, just incorporating some mechanical components, um, some springs to keep it in the equilibrium position and return it after the hydraulic cylinder has been extended through the high pressure hydraulics. Um, and it's quite neat. Obviously it looks uh, quite similar to how it started, but it's got some springs on it. It's got a rubber bump stop to help it not smash itself to bits and return. Um, and then it's got a unique sweep, but that's not the one showing there as well. Um, the hydraulic demands obviously require circuitry for that to work. But then essentially, if you think of that as a black box, you could think of it as a spray nozzle and then you're just giving it a signal to say, go. And instead of it spraying something, it's hitting something. Um, so a design parameters, like I said, it needed to be about a quarter to a third of a second in and out of the ground. And then our initial trial with one static module sort of showed we could achieve that. So that was the high speed camera footage at the bottom with the timestamps at the bottom. Um, there was quite a lot of industry interest, obviously, as we started to show what was possible um, towards the end of the project in 2019 um, before COVID. Um, and so there was various things. We started to do lots of demonstrations led by um, Michael over east through New South Wales and Queensland with lots of road trips, which was very neat, getting our large machine on and off low loading trucks and getting into paddocks and traveling across the countryside to make that happen. Um, there was obviously a real need from the industry, but that was also demonstrated through all these field days that we did with very good attendance, um, sort of, yeah, like 500 farmers, lots of the videos, I haven't looked at recent numbers, but um, they'd had lots of views and things. There was lots of momentum at the time. Um, and the reason, obviously, and you know more about this, many of you than me, I'm an engineer, not a ag um, scientist, but obviously weeds cost Australian grain growers a lot, like $3.3 billion per annum in lost revenue and control measures. And so the device is conservation cropping compatible. It's low cost per um, area to operate, might have a quite an expensive upfront cost to get a machine because of the hydraulics predominantly, on the system, but unlike something that you have to feed chemical and be paying for chemical year in, year out, uh, you have a large capex, but then operational costs are um, in theory lower. And so uh, it was designed to be implementable with like a tractor unit so that you could relate to it, but obviously it could then be partnered in theory with something like a swarm farm robot or a robotic platform. And one of our last demos um, was actually at swarm farms headquarters to sort of allude to that possibility. 
Um, this was actually from the pitch deck from the innovator of the year. So red box was a problem, herbicide resistance, um, potential glyphosate bans, export okay. bans. Um, so then it was, well, green, we're solving some of these. Weeds aren't resistant to steel um, yet. Uh, and that strategic uh, cultivation was potentially um, possible with this sort of device. And from a marketing point of view, particularly in Western Australia, being the largest grain producing region of um, the country, there could be this idea of, um, but also across Australia, of leading the world in um, producing products that potentially don't have some of the um, potential negative connotations that sometimes get labelled in this industry. So the problem was very real. The solution um, was simple, effective and sustainable, no chemicals, um, compatible with conservation cropping. And the benefits obviously would be taken up by the farmers if the device um, was commercialised. And towards the end of the project, we had ha actually had a commercialisation strategy and secured a commercialised um, Zation partner um, through the development of the IP that we had done. Um, it wasn't patented. It was around uh, published and registered designs and know-how and packaged. A commercial partner had come on board, um, but that was just before COVID time and other pressures. And unfortunately, that didn't work out. And so we're still in the process now of navigating um, that process into commercialization so that product can be actually available to farmers because that's actually ultimately what needs to happen. Um, and so we're navigating that and making progress. And so hopefully um, some more should come out soon about where we're going with that in particular and some more news to follow, we hope. So we're working with um, farmers developing a system at the moment, uh, building a large scale device with a commercial manufacturer to see if that looks like it can work. Um, some of the other opportunities that we're doing with where the weed chipper is going. So uh, Michael Walsh was on a Fulbright fellowship last year and through interactions with US colleagues, uh, looking at supplying plot scale weed chippers into the US to help build that momentum and demand and sort of knowledge around alternative technologies like this one. And so we're in the process of uh, producing two devices, a um, nine tine and a seven tine if i can count um rig at the moment and one of them the one with the photos there is the larger unit and that's currently being built and assembled um at the center uh literally as we speak so those photos were from this morning um yeah so i think some of you may be popping out later this afternoon to the center um you'll see it and so uh where have we been going so that was all around sort of fellow weed control this sort of technology is um obviously potentially applicable in crop particularly row cropping situations uh particularly if you think in row cropping situations in the inter row scenario not um necessarily intra row and so uh we were successfully awarded a project from the department of agriculture fisheries and forestry and we're working our way through that um at the moment and so that's looking at Again, similar sort of scenarios, low density weeds in row cropping situations, crops such as sorghum, cotton, um, the usual suspects in terms of weeds, but also things like return cotton. Um, originally when the project was looked at was some sort of rapid response time approach, plus other architectures, varying row widths. Um, so this was from early days um, in the project. And essentially the take home message here is when there's crop plants around, as you can appreciate, there needs to be a lot more finesse than what the weed chipper was doing. Um, so we start to come up, mentalize this into looking at, well, stuff between row crops and potentially intra row, and then prioritizing the developments around the inter row. Um, obviously it needs to be super accurate, a lot more finesse than what was demonstrated. Minimum soil disturbance, again, speeds comparable to what is typical in the market, but it's linked obviously to the width. Um, obviously you can go slower if you go wider or you have multiple units like swarms of things, very high efficacy, flexibility to accommodate different row systems. Unfortunately, I can't talk too much about what we've actually been developing. I wanted to, but the patent lawyers haven't given me the okay. They're meant to be filed already, but they're not. Um, but so then the hows, so we, with part of our project, we looked at um, understanding what the the industry um, wants in terms of 
requirements and then what that means from an engineering point of view of characteristics we design for. So it became apparent early on that it would work uh, quite well as an implement that could be pulled behind a um, tractor. Um, and then yeah, you can probably read the rest. Um, and that's essentially it. So that's sort of where we're heading. Hopefully that's painted a bit of a picture of what we're up to. Thanks. All right, some questions out in the audience. All right, I'll have a question then. Um, is, you know, when you chip it, is it as invasive as tilling? Like when you, like, I suppose if you till the soil versus chip, is that as invasive to the soil? Is it the same force disruption to the soil? And just where I'm going with this is a bit random, is at what point aren't you doing conservation tillage if you chip 40% of your field, 30%? Yeah, there are rules around that, I suppose. Um, yeah, okay. So I think the part, part of the answer is around we're only ever talking around low weed densities. So like one weed per 10 square meters. Um, the, the reason why I showed the two videos at the start with the larger weed chipper is because the first one potentially um, paints a picture of more soil disturbance looking like tillage and not lending itself towards the name of the weed chipper. The second one and some of those other videos and images should show that it actually does perform a very like chipping action and it's about 0.3 of a square meter it's only about the size of the footprint of the sweep so it is actually a minimal soil disturbance the trial showed that it was about two percent across a massive field um i think it's highly compatible obviously there's patches where you'd end up with more weeds and then it might be that you end up essentially tilling them um but yeah, it was very much a mandate to make sure that it wasn't tillage, but it was targeted tillage or chipping. Thank you. Question. Ken. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the depth aspect, so the original weed chipper was uh, about two inches, 50 mil um, depth. You're right around the in-crop has more requirements, restrictions on interfering with adjacent uh, crop plants. So uh, that's why I made the comment around we're working on stuff that's got a lot more finesse and control. But part of that is also what, frames this idea around at least low hanging fruit and of some value to the industry is the inter row aspect. So the boundaries of on the outside of the inter row, obviously they start to get closer to where the roots are and the crop plants are. Um, and so that's part of our thinking and framing our thoughts around um, it's useful in the middle middle as you get closer, it needs more and more finesse and shallower and better control. But we're on row cropping systems, although we'll see application ideally eventually in um, like your wheats and barleys down the track. We're talking things that are like more like sorghum, cotton, very wide row spacings and focusing on the inter row. That data would be really useful too. And we wanted also to look at distributions of weeds and all sorts of things, but obviously you can't do everything. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, um, so two parts maybe to this answer. One is that I'm not the best place person to answer this because I'm an engineer, not the weed scientist. But um, the feedback that we had and from the trials that we did, particularly over um, east where the project came out of from the GRDC mandate, um, a northern cropping region, some of those big woody species um, and what's growing over there, there are no herbicide options at all to remove them. And so farmers would more 
happily see that weed gone and its ability not to set seed and create more of a seed bank and take away nutrients, water, et cetera, um, than actually leave it there. Though we did flag ourselves that um, looking at growth of weeds once you disturb the soil to actually more weeds germinate. Um, I don't have the data with me to see where that got to. All right. Um, should close this because we're on time. So thank we're you. We're on time. Much. Thank you. And thank you to all the speakers in the session and yesterday and today. And now we're going to change a pace. We're going to have a panel session. Brett, and I'm not in charge because Brett sacked me. He wouldn't let you didn't charge three. Okay, so here we go. Panel session. Oh, I got to read the words on the screen. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we have a panel session looking to the future of PA in farm management in Australia. And we have all the young farmers who went to university and learned lots of ag tech and they're going to speak. So welcome. First we have, do I call them out one at a time? Yeah. Oh, it's like a, okay. It's like world wrestling, isn't it? Anyway, let's go. Thanks, Tom. You're such a great chair and manager of people. The other one's here, Mr. Brett Whelan, who's told me what to do and how many questions I can ask and not to go off on a tangent. So I'm going to do my best. But you need to do this. Oh, okay. So the yeah, I'm not one of the young ones. We are about to launch into a red hot sort of review with young people. So there was obviously a selection criteria for this crew to have no grey hair and no male pattern baldness. So we've got five people from around Australia who are old enough to have had a lot of experience, but then young enough not to know better. So we're going to get their view on the world in relation to uh, Precision Ag. My name is uh, Michael Ayres. I'm in or on the SPA committee, but in the soils division, which no one else on the committee knows about yet. So, which reminds me, I'm going to bring it up at the next meeting. So I just thought I'd introduce that concept here before it gets legs. Um, firstly, I'll get everyone to walk through if you don't mind, guys. So Tom Longmire, they'll all explain themselves briefly. From Curon Pastoral in Esperance. Uh, Brett Egan, third one here. They don't look too excited. He's also from Esperance, but he's in the Cappuccino strip. So Tom on the end is from pretty hard, rugged country at Beaumont, uh, who's sitting next to a hard, rugged person, Mr. James Venning. The next one down, second along, who's from hard, rugged country in the north of, uh, as he explained before, the uh, York Peninsula. You've got Brad. There's a bit of politics here. Brad is Young Farmer of the Year in Australia, which is great, and he's been doing a roadshow for the last few months around there. James on his left, so second from the end, was a finalist, but I think because of his police record, that was all <laughs> squash. So Brad then won the award, but they both won an award for excellence, which is fantastic in that space. And Andrew Sargent, who'll explain himself, but he's from sort of red loam, really soft, kind of soft, climate finished country in the mid north of South Australia. So he the red sands that James second from the end got, sorry to explain this, is usually come from Crystal Brook where Andrew's from. So when James explains his red sands, it's probably Andrew's soil over hundreds of years. So and Tiana to keep everything cool and neat and tidy is an agronomist with Piritus Ag in the north of WA. So she'll explain and give a little background on herself and we'll just move through and then we'll get into the two questions that Brett's allowed us to ask. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Tiana. Just a background. Yep. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Tiana. I'm uh, born and raised uh, around Geraldton, family farm at Walkway, um, and I've been with Viridus Ag since February, so I'm pretty new to the um, precision ag sp space. Um, yeah, that's, that's me. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Andrew Sargent, Crystal Brook. Um, I think Michael's probably done a better 
better uh, introduction than we will do for ourselves. But um, yeah, wheat, barley, lentils, uh, Crystal Brook. I've uh, been dabbling in PA for 20 something years. Um, and I guess we've sort of been in and out of it a bit. So yeah, I uh, did enough of scholarship in 2019 looking at open source ag tech and how we might be able to use that to maybe overcome some of the challenges we've been facing. Uh, yeah, Brad Egan. Um, yeah, most of you would have heard me talk yesterday yesterday about our operation, but yeah, been back on the family farm since 2017 and yeah, love utilising ag data and precision ag to make better management decisions. And um, yeah, as far as your cappuccino strip um, joke there, Michael, not not quite there. I'm on the east side of Scadden. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, unfortunately, we're just in the rain shadow of what, what Tom gets at Beaumont there. Yeah, a bit like Brad. Um, feel a bit silly introducing myself, but only was just out there before. But yeah, so yeah, grow on York Peninsula, um, South Australia. Yeah, northern part of it though, so it's not crazy wet like the middle. But uh, yeah, doing a bit of ag, um, ag tech stuff, moisture probes, weather stations, stuff I spoke about, and yeah, yeah, uh, home on the farm since uh, end of twenty nineteen when I finished uni. Um, yeah, a bit the same, quite enjoy the ag tech and getting involved and, and chatting to everyone here about it all. Thanks guys. You keep the microphone, Tom, just to ask the first question of all of you, and then just pass it along again, as you've just done then from a precision ag perspective, just to explain what's working for you, what does work for you now? And if you're explaining it to farmers, what they need to look at first to get into this space. What's the best you've... Yeah, I'd say probably having a platform, like a solid platform of boundary maps and file structures has probably been the, I guess, the key to having it all uh, move fluidly between machinery. Um, the guidance and internal and external boundary, we've got that pretty reliable now. Um, and I'm looking forward to a bit of development from John Deere and a few of the companies to get that a bit easier to use uh, in the machine. Uh, but a lot of the variable stuff nowadays works quite well actually getting into tractors, but um, we're very big on that. If we can't get it working and a rain's coming or something, we'll just keep like turn off the map and get going. Um, timing's still more critical than all the ag tech. Um, yeah, if you miss that rain window, and you don't get your ear air on, it's probably worse than uh, trying to make a couple of savings with VR. So, yeah, timing's sort of our big one. Yeah, so um, I probably spoke about what was working for us up on stage, but I guess one thing that probably is at the core of it all is just having great independent advice. So, um, yeah, I've got a really good agronomist, uh, Sam Trengrove, who's my agronomist, but he's also my PA advisor as well because he's into the precision ag stuff. So just having that great level of trust with him, like, a, you know, I'm probably a skept skeptical person sometimes so that you know, if I was getting that advice from someone that um, benefits in any way, apart from just a consultancy, um, sometimes I probably wouldn't necessarily trust that. Like, and I find manufacturers or um, ag tech providers, like quite often there's, there's value to be derived and it may be, so for example, there's sort of $10 of value to be derived, but quite often the farmer's paying $9 to extract that 10 and that's $9. So your farmer's taking all the risk. It's uh, a new product. So there's no iron, there's limited R and D farmers doing the R and D. And then by the time that the R and D is all sorted out, the technology's moved and you're just left with this, this lemon. So um, yeah, having this, uh, not lemon, that's probably a bad Term, but just yeah, just having like great advice around you, and yeah, because I'm yeah having like a yeah numbers a bit like probably Brad's going to probably talk about. Yeah, I fully agree with what these two guys have just said. Um, and yeah, like I spoke about what's working for us a bit yesterday, but um, just to further like Tom's point, it's you know what's really worked for us is matching what's happening on the physical farm to what's happening on the digital farm. So, you know, matched up boundaries and good application records um, in a digitized platform so you can have, you know, good data to then be able to utilize to make good decisions off. 
Um, and then, yeah, having a good platform. So we utilize PCT Ad Cloud for data analysis and making very right um, maps and then embedding, <coughs> excuse me, embedding um, trial strips within to make sure that what we are doing is, you know, the right decision. And then the, the final step is obviously quantifying. So not just going out doing very right map or test strip, but actually coming back at the end and analyzing what we've changed, um, what variable we've changed to see what the outcome is. Um, I did have another point, but it sort of lost, <laughs> lost my run from my mind. But um, yeah, that, that's the main one that's been working for us is especially variable rate because, you know, we have variability in our soils and climate. So we have to be, you know, varying our inputs to then be able to match. Yeah, I guess, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think our PA journey has probably been longer than, well, probably as long as some of you guys, but I've been there through all of it. And I guess we started out and there was all these things we could measure and all these things we could do. And we sort of probably got overwhelmed with with all the options that there was. And then um, I think that the speaker we had after the break, we were talking about adoption and what you think you might be able to do with it. And then what <clears throat> you actually end up doing with it are two very different things. Um, so I think you need to find find a problem that you've got, not, a technology that you've got that can fix the problem and sort of work back from there. So I go, I need to fix this problem. And then what technology is available that will help me fix that problem? And can I actually, will I actually change what I'm doing with that technology? Um, so we've, we've now gone and we do variable rate phosphorus, um, try to target areas with high PBIs to get a better phosphorus response, <clears throat> variable rate lime, obviously get a better return. You guys are all well of liming. Um, Whereas I guess before we were sort of looking at things that were affecting our production, but we weren't actually able to make a change in we would have we had the data, but we couldn't change what we were doing to actually get any benefit from that. So yeah, I think finding stuff that you can actually manage and will actually change what you do um, is is pretty important. Um, I guess I differ from these guys in the fact that I see PA systems across Australia on all our properties rather than just on one farm. And I think what that sort of taught me is that it's not a one size fits all. And it, you, like we've got farms that are pretty much next door to each other and they're still a different system. So I think really like to the point before of understanding what your problems are and work from there, not um, not the capability of the machine and what problems that might identify. Um, and I also think when, when you're starting a PA journey and um, which I think is probably the most important part is what are we trying to do with these zones? Are we, are we trying to in, in variable rate, are we trying to build these up and, and make the paddock more even, or are we accepting that these zones, you know, whether it be for water holding capacity will just never ever um, be what we want them to be and, and treat them accordingly from there. Your issue then, Tiana, as we call it, is scarable rate <laughs> between different farms, different people, different opinions, different egos and different ways of doing things. No, thank you for those insights. Now to Brett's next question. Do you mind, Brett, if I move on to yours? I'll... Um, sorry, I've got to go turn the page. Uh, going back to Tom, again, again, on the end there, just what ideally would you like to be able to measure that you can't or don't now? Soils, crops, climate, anything in your PA system? A fair bit. Uh, but <laughs> now, uh, now you've got the robot. Yeah, there's probably, uh, now we've taken on the swarm bot, there's probably a lot more scope to, to really get into, I guess, measuring soil water and stuff across a whole paddock quite intensively. Um, I'd also, yes, I sort of mentioned about... Um, yeah, the want to uh, <clears throat> measure like snails per hectare and be able to verberate mice bait and actually target pests based on soil types that they prefer to live in or, or hot spots due to a hailstorm or just uh, bits like that, that I reckon we could uh, improve our uh, use case, I guess. Um, yeah, when, when sort of you have advice coming out of they've done one hundred meter walk down your paddock and, and given you a mice holes per, yeah. How many mice you've got per hectare there for a thousand. It, it seems a bit agricultural to be honest. Like, um, but yeah, it, it's sort of, 
if we can get a bit more intensive on the whole mapping side of it and and I guess like that trying to work with advisors or consultants to actually build a data layer that matches our machine capacity to um, a lot of the maps we get from consultants have zone sizes the size of this room and by the time the air seat has got down to the right rate we're already back through it and back out the other side so just sort of I guess working with all of that but yeah I reckon this water holding or soil soil water for a second round of nitrogen where I could map it probably the day before we go spreading and have an accurate uh, representation of all our soil types and whether that's hollows whether it's running off the hills and really get into maximizing our production Yeah, I tend to agree pretty heavily with there. Like, so I just think anything that you can measure that is measuring yield potential. So soil water, I think is massive. And there was talk on it sort of earlier on in our environment, I think we're going to really struggle. So for instance, a lentil will, the rooting depth of the lentil is pretty poor on some sands. Um, it leaves a lot of water behind and that's half the reason our amelioration program is to try and improve that. But yeah, we're still leaving water behind. So all these sort of methods of, of, um, measuring like electric conductivity or em picks up that soil water but then it also goes down to the loams where that we're a drive and that also reads higher in electric conductivity and em so sort of trying to tease trying to filter the water away from the other constraints would be fantastic um compaction's another one um yeah so if we can map the compaction that's another constraint to yield potential so i think like you're really trying to grab that yield potential um part because I feel like that's a low hanging fruit and it's very, um, it's very proper driving. Sometimes, you know, like I talk about variable rate fungicides on my lentils, like it's, it's a feel good, like a carbonism costs three to four dollars a hectare. So, like, it's not a low hanging fruit. So, just these big production, um, gains. And yeah, not to try and sound like a broken record, <laughs> very similar. Um, plant available water. It's a, yeah, better understand what potential um, we're dealing with because we have a geographical spread of our three um, farms. So, you know, year to year, we can get significant differences in rainfall. And then depending on soil constraints, the, the amount of water the plant has access to to then be able to grow yield um, can significantly change. Um, but, you know, I'm excited to see the work that's come out of um, what Patrick and the Wellses have done with his soil constraints um, project that, you know, we'll part of that um to yeah then be able to sort of work out how to distribute a weather station network and a soil probe um network to better understand that um and to further that not just on on rainfall and uh, bland available water but also getting more readings on temperature humidity solar radiation to then be able to make better management decisions for you know timing of flowering of certain varieties to try and really optimize what we're growing and, and dodge you know specific stress periods like heat stress or frost um and then yeah the other the other big one that i love and i think everyone would is a crystal ball into the <laughs> what the weather's going to do um better weather forecasting would be great to be able to make better management decisions um and yeah it is frustrating when you do go make a call on a nitrogen management decision and then um something that's been forecast for 10 days just fizzles out to nothing so yeah, that would be a yeah big big help as well, and something that another thing that I, I'd love that has been in the back of my brain for a while is being able to record like deep ripping depth because across our soils, different soil types, um, yeah, the deep river goes into different depths depending on how deep you can pull it or whether there's rock there. And at the moment, it's just a manual process; it's the operator lifting up and down. But if we can record, you know, what sort of depth we're achieving. In the future, if we do go to autonomy, um, the robot needs to be able to vary. So, yeah, having that added layer of um, of, an, of an application would, yeah, also be useful. Well, good to see we're all on the same page. I think you four or three have covered everything I thought of. Um, but, yeah, I guess some of it is you don't know what you don't know too, I guess. Um, you know, yesterday they were talking about using EM to measure soil moisture and I guess we always thought as EM as a, a one-pass thing, you do it once and you wouldn't have to come back and do it again, whereas potentially now there's an option to to mount that on a machine and get a better better map of soil water. Soil water. 
Um, having said that, I think in our environment, it's probably more going to be to do with the crystal ball. Um, it's driven a lot. Uh, our management decisions are probably driven more by what the forecast is than what the existing soil moisture was leading up to it, um, just given the timing of our urea applications. So, um, yeah, you guys have covered it all anyway. Yeah, I'm probably in the same boat um, and definitely think that the soil moisture is, especially up our way, is a big one. Um, but to cover off on something different, I think that um, the implementation of like permanent uh, monitoring sites, I think um, is going to be key moving forward to making sure all these systems that we're implementing are done properly. Um, and you spoke about um, the shotgun approach to scouting and a recommendation based on one corner of a paddock that, you know, can affect hectares and hectares. So I, I'm not sure the best way to do it. Um, and I know on some of our properties, it's a nightmare uh, trying to make especially um, production forecasts on some of the paddocks. Um, but I think that, yeah, things like even the CSBP detect um, and, yeah, sort of streamlining where we're doing um, what well, we do it anyway in terms of soil tests and tissue tests, but what other um, monitoring um, uh, techniques can we use in those same spots to not only uh, follow the progression of the paddock and those zones, um, but also make better in-field decisions. Um, and then the other thing I think that sort of was in the Ray Harrington cl clip was that weeds definitely define a lot of our farming systems, especially in Northern WA. Um, and with the season, not always the longest, especially like something like this year, I think it's really important, especially on our properties that are you know, plus 5,000 hectares, um, all of them to understand how we effectively manage logistics around weed control is massive in terms of moisture conservation. Thank you very much. How much time we've got, Tom? You're running the show. Brett. We're over time. Brett, got to go back to you. Sorry, sir. We're... No, thank you very much, guys. Great insights. Just one little quick uh to Tom Longmire reminded me, he talked about precision ag. There's a guy I worked with called Scott Linda. He won't mind me saying this in Malian, Victoria, but he baited five times uh, when the mice were bad a few years ago and I was in the paddock with him and he was so happy to tell me from a precision ag point of view how many holes per square metre he thought, how many mice per hole, and he worked it out. But he baited five times, so he's furious. So to justify the expense, he's then telling me he's worked out on the weight of a mouse, I can't remember how many grams, and protein, the breakdown, he was trying to work out mineralisation, but he gave me a figure of 45 kilos of urea equivalent of what he's added back to his soil. So he felt good about it. So he justified the cost. That's precision aid. But um, thank you, everybody. Thank you for these youngsters and the insights they've just given us. Much appreciated. Thanks, Tom. I think it really is over, all right? Um, Brett, do we, what happens now? We have lunch. We, we retreat and have lunch. And Oh, no, we have a QR code, and we do the evaluation of the chairing, which was excellent. Okay, so th thank you. <laughs>
It's an amazing opportunity to reflect on the many new opportunities for our members and research industries. These days couldn't have been made possible without the support of our sponsors and our 35 speakers. Thank you for your contributions and time and travel. And this includes our major event sponsor, GRDC, and thanks Liam and Rowan for making your way over. Uh, the dinner sponsor, CSBP, last night, along with GPA and Brad Hogg and sponsors and exhibitors, including John Deere, Case H, Bayer, Fieldview, Hardy, Swap Maps, Magrotech, Axitech, and AgriFutures. And also big thanks to the Swan River Hotel staff and AV teams. We hope you found the event informative, thought-provoking, and helped create new networks. And we look forward to seeing you all soon and keeping in touch with you all through the networks. For those who are attending the Industry Roundtable on Interoperability, please join us back here, I think, at 1.45, if that's all good. Yep. And there'll be some spare seats available if you haven't registered, but it will be a great opportunity to contribute feedback to, uh, to managing it. For those who are attending the field tour, please meet um, at the lobby tomorrow morning at 7.30, like Brett's, um, uh, Brent's email. And if you haven't registered, please see Ange, Brent, or myself, and we can see whether we might be able to squeeze you on the bus or at least carpool you to the site. And finally, I'd like to extend my sincere appreciation and thank you to our SPA team, including Ange, who joined the team in April. It's actually her first SPA event, and you've done an absolutely amazing job. Um, and as well as Colin noted, submitted about 20 pages of EOIs last Friday. So on top of all the event prep and planning, so it's been a busy few weeks for you. Brent, um, up the back, has also done a wonderful job with our comms. And also to Kylie, our CPA accountant and finance extraordinaire. Sadly, after eight years with the team, Kylie's about to embark on an next journey beyond SPA. And we're really appreciative of your contributions and financial advice. And we will definitely miss you, even though we still think you're a bit weird with red wine and ice. And thank you to the SPA committee team. Um, some of us are lucky enough to not have to travel too far with Frank closest being 30 minutes away, but also as far as air um, in Queensland with Dennis. So all of the team are volunteers um, in the committee. So we do put a lot of time and effort in and it's great to see you all over here in the West um, and basically have a year without having to hop on a plane for once. Um, to Brett Whelan and Patrick Filippi and the University of Sydney PA lab teams, thank you so much for your support and collaboration again. And on that note, I'd like to thank all of the attendees and declare the formal symposium closed and please join us for lunch. And we hope you have safe travels and hope to catch up with you at our next event or symposium. So if I can just have Kylie, Brent, Brett and Patrick and Ange to come up, we've just got a couple of things to give you as well. Thanks everyone.